Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to uh, what I know will be an exciting couple days from us. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Mark Lyons and I'm with USDA APIS Veterinary Services and I'm the Acting Director for the Ruminant Health Center, which leads our uh, cattle, sheep, goat, and servant health programs. As you can imagine, we take vectors and vector-borne diseases very seriously within our commodity programs and species. So it has been an absolute pleasure to be able to bring this together. Um, it's been wonderful to work and collaborate with the National Cowman's Beef Association and many of our other partners to really get this week's symposium uh, together. Uh, I would be remiss in not taking the time to thank each of you for joining this call and making this uh, a part of your busy schedules. Um, but to that end, we do have a very full packed agenda. Um, we had it up on screen, we'll touch on it here in a, in a little bit, but it's gonna be a really great chance for us to dive into some of these uh, discussions on ticks, um, focusing primarily on those ticks that do have an impact on our industry and on our commodities. Uh, and with such a, gr a great variety of the stakeholders and uh, industries present here on the call, um, I'm really looking forward to some of those collaborative discussions we're gonna have. Um, looking forward to seeing what will come out of the next couple of days and then uh, identifying other areas that we can really kind of move forward with as we kind of move forward. Um, and move ahead with, with kind of our tick response programs. So with that in mind, um, let me go ahead and pause and introduce Denise Bonilla. Um, she is really our center's resident expert on all things entomology. Um, you'll be hearing from her more today um, in the agenda, of course, but she does have a few schedule updates to share um, as we kind of get things started. Um, so let me go ahead without further ado, hand it off to you, Denise, to go ahead and give us those updates. And again, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. Hi, and, and thanks, Mark. Um, so hi again, I'm Denise Bonilla. I'll, I'm gonna be your facilitator today. So I'm gonna um, introduce everyone and get them started on their talks. As Mark mentioned, we do have um, a schedule update for you. Um, uh, Mr. John DeCanza, who's the director of our cattle fever tick eradication program here at the USDA um, is dealing with some health complications um, and, and working through those and trying to be healthy. So I'm gonna, I will be presenting that we're not gonna miss the cattle fever tick talk. I will be presenting the, uh, um, my, my own cattle fever tick talk that I normally give. We'll, um, we'll have that instead for you. So we'll have that. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, I'm facilitating today. I will also be facilitating the questions and answers at the end of the day. So if you have a question along the way, if you want to put it in the chat, we will um, hold on to those uh, and we will um, go through them at um, the end of the day during our question and answer session. And definitely feel free to um, hang on to those and not put them in the chat and we can talk about them later on. So um, just to let you know that this is being recorded. If by some chance you need to leave for some reason, we will have um, we will have a recording of that up on the NCBA website sometime in the near future. So um, we have that for you. So with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna be quiet and I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce our first speaker, um, one of many amazing folks that we have for you in the next two days. And he, um, Dr. Michael Yabsley from the University of Georgia, is going to be speaking to you on um, the ticks of veterinary importance. So with that, I will turn it over to him. Thank you very much. Thanks, Denise. And thanks um, for the invite to speak to you all and thank you for attending. So I am tasked with talking to you about some introductory comments related to ticks of veterinary importance. And you can see here, I tossed in human as well. And so as I go through this talk, you're gonna see it's really hard sometimes to separate uh, the animal and human side of ticks and tick-borne diseases. And so with that, um, I'm just going to go through and give you guys uh, a somewhat brief introduction to ticks uh, and tick-borne diseases. And as you've probably seen on the agenda, you're going to have very specific talks focused in on different tick species and different pathogens. And so I'll try not to delve too much into what those folks will be talking about. So. Um, you're all already here because you're interested in ticks or concerned about ticks, so I'm probably preaching to the choir about how important ticks are, but please indulge me for a little while. Um, if you absorb any media um, related to ticks, it's probably going to be related to tick-borne diseases and the concerns surrounding them for humans. 
And you'll see things like the tick apocalypse is coming and it's bringing all of these diseases with it. Um, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand that there's a lot more diseases out there than just Lyme disease associated with ticks. Although hopefully I can strike a balance to not scare you, um, but inform you. So we're gonna talk about beyond Lyme. It's not the only disease out there. Um, and then the headlines every year that come up are gonna be, this is gonna be a bad year for ticks or this is gonna be a bad year for Lyme disease. And it's sort of a joke because every year is a bad year for ticks, really. Um, and then I don't know why ticks are gonna surprise us that this is gonna be a big year, but there we go. So again, most of these topics are focused in on human health, um, but certainly we're here because of interests related to agricultural health, uh, related to ticks and tick-borne pathogens. And so a big focus of the two-day symposium here is going to be on Haemophysalis longicornis, the Asian longhorn tick. Um, but some talks also will be on Texas cattle fever and then uh, pathogens associated with these ticks. So I um, just want to give you some brief information about ticks uh, in terms of their importance worldwide um, for transmission of pathogens. They're second only to mosquitoes. And here in the United States, they're actually responsible for transmission of more pathogens than mosquitoes are. Um, when we're talking specifically about agricultural production, uh, all around the world, tick-borne diseases are very, very important, and in some areas are one of the more significant issues that the industry faces. Again, here in the United States, we tend to think of ticks um, more of a risk for people and our pets, but hopefully over the next few days, you're going to gain an appreciation of why they're important for you all as well. And showing up here at the top, I have a selection of pretty ticks. Um, I'm, a, I'm a tick person, so I can appreciate their beauty, but of course, I spend a lot of my time talking about why they're bad, so try not to focus too much on how pretty some of them can be. Um, and with that, um, there's going to be a lot of talk about pathogens, but I don't want to be pathogen-centric. Ticks alone can actually cause issues uh, related to just their presence on animals, and so if you have significant numbers, you can have issues with blood loss which actually is a, a real big issue for moose. There's a syndrome called ghost moose associated with derma center infestations that essentially kill moose in the winter because of blood loss and exposure from skin damage. Having all those ticks feeding on you can cause a lot of damage to your skin, which can lead to secondary infections. They can damage the hide. Um, of course, all of that's gonna be very irritating. Um, for production uh, concerns, you've got reduced weight gain, reduced milk production, um, and then some things we'll touch on later on in this talk are toxicoses and allergies as well, which is sort of an unusual thing associated with ticks. Now, um, you can see here um, some of the damage caused by the ticks on the skin of a deer ear up here and then down here. All of this damage here is actually due to amblyomma ticks feeding around the eyes and on the face of fawns. And unfortunately, in some parts of the country like Arkansas and Missouri, um, Kansas, we get fawns in like this um, every year that have significant damage caused by ticks. So how are they causing damage? Well, again, not to scare you, but you know, if you've ever had a tick attached to you, you know, sometimes it can be hard to pull them out. Sometimes it can be hard to pull out the whole tick because part of it's embedded in your skin. So what these ticks are doing when they attach to you is actually they use these slicing mouth parts that they stick down into your skin. And then they have these other mouth parts that stick down and they have these backward facing barbs. So they're essentially, um, glued into your skin. So that's why it can be quite difficult to pull them out. And then as they're about to feed and while they're feeding, they're releasing a whole bunch of compounds into your system. Anticoagulants to keep the blood flowing, vasodilators to bring more blood to them, and then anti-inflammatories so that you don't necessarily feed them, uh, feel them doing all of this to you. So you can see in that animation there, a female tick um, attached and then she fully engorged with blood. So what she's gonna do now is fall off of that host, to go off into the environment, uh, use all of that blood and resources to produce lots and lots of eggs. So whenever we talk about ticks, typically we're gonna have a whole list of pathogens associated with them. So this right here is sort of a, a laundry list of the more common pathogens associated with ticks that are important to humans. And you'll see in a minute, animals will incorporate in here. So you guys have not heard me lecture before, but my students will always groan because they know I'm going to go through every one of these in excruciating detail. Sadly, I was not given six hours to talk to you guys. I was only given 50 minutes, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but we will touch on a couple of the um, more common ones or more important ones. But you can see here a huge diversity of pathogens associated with humans. 
And then there's actually these other non-pathogenic conditions I'll touch on, like paralysis and allergy, uh, red meat allergy in particular. And then as you look at this list, these are all impacting humans but I can add on dogs. So these are gonna be pathogens associated with dogs and cats can also be a concern for a lot of these pathogens. And then on top of that, cattle can actually get tick paralysis, which is why I'll talk about it. And then cattle don't necessarily share a whole lot of these pathogens with dogs, cats, and humans, but they have their own list here that we'll talk about. And as I'm talking to you about these different pathogens, one of my students, Alec, is out in the field here, you can see, educating some of our other constituents about ticks and tick-borne diseases. Um, tick-borne diseases are nothing new. They've been around forever. All the way back to the early 1900s, we recognized pathogens associated with ticks and people. But as you can see over time, the number of pathogens and diseases we've identified have increased dramatically, especially within the past couple of decades. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, spatially, uh, it's important where you live as to which pathogens may, have, may be of most importance to you. So you can see here is just six different pathogens of humans associated with ticks. And this is going to be related to the distribution of the different tick vectors that I'll talk about in a minute. But you can see if you're in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, there are certain diseases like these top three that are going to be most important for you. Um, and then there's others that are more broadly distributed or have a more southerly distribution. And then, like I said, I'll go through a couple of these as examples for each of the different tick vectors we'll talk about today. Um, and although I'll, I've sort of compartmentalized a lot of these pathogens into a particular tick species that transmits it, and I only talk about that particular pathogen, it's important to remember that ticks really are just bags of pathogens. So they can have one, two, three, or even more pathogens associated with them. And of course, they've got all of their normal microflora as well. So we really need to think about ticks as having these suites of pathogens. So each exodes, for example, could have one or more of the typical pathogens associated with it. And whereas a lot of these pathogens are bacterial and can be treated with antibiotics, not all of them are. We've got viruses and parasites that aren't going to respond to that same treatment. So it's important to remember that um, as you start thinking clinically about tick-borne diseases. Um, and with that, I want to transition over and start talking about a couple um, major groups of ticks. Um, when we think about the tick groups, we can separate them into soft ticks that are shown here on the left and hard ticks that are shown on the right. There's a huge amount of diversity between these two broad categories of ticks that I'm not necessarily going to be able to get into a lot of detail about, but they're all ticks. They all have the capabilities of causing issues for animals and people and transmit pathogens that are associated with that particular species. Um, but it's also important to remember that they diverged long ago, so there's some really interesting biological differences between them. And it, they diverged so long ago, actually, that um, there's quite a large number of ticks that have been preserved in amber, um, going back millions and millions of years, some of the, to the time of the dinosaurs. And you can see here that in this piece of amber, there's actually ticks that are very, very similar looking to the typical hard ticks that we have uh, present nowadays. So with that, I'm gonna move over and start talking about soft ticks. And so these are an unusual group of ticks. Um, they're not nearly as common as the hard ticks that we tend to think about. But I do want to talk about them because a number of folks in, in your little uh, questionnaire at the beginning of registration uh, expressed an interest in soft ticks. And so these ticks are typically going to be found in nests of animals or in crevices uh, and hiding out in different places away from animals. They don't have a typical seasonal activity like we do see with the hard ticks. Um, and because they are found in nests of birds and uh, rodents and whatnot, they can get up into very high numbers and they can really irritate these animals and they essentially can either assanguinate chicks and kill them or they can bother them so much that the parents will actually leave those nests and abandon the chicks. And then of course, with all ticks, uh, pathogens are gonna be a concern as well. So I know you guys don't know a whole lot about the life cycle of different types of ticks, but I'll just point out here that soft ticks are very different from the hard ticks that I'll talk about next. Um, one big difference here is that when we tend to think of the hard ticks, they're attached to animals or ourselves, um, and oftentimes for an extended period of time, and that's not the, the case with soft ticks. The larvae, the first stage that you can see right here, 
um, does attach to hosts for a number of days. The number of days depends on the species um, and take a blood meal and fall off. But then as it goes through the numerous different nymphal stages, you can see that if they feed at all, some species don't, um, they only feed for an hour or maybe two. So they're very short duration feeders. So what these ticks do is they're hiding in the nests and in those crevices. And when the animal comes along and is sleeping, they'll just run out, grab a quick blood meal, and then run back to their home. And that's very unlike the ticks um, that we tend to think of uh, on our animals. And then once they um, get up to the adult stage, you can see that if they feed, they only feed for a few minutes at a time, and then they mate off the host and lay eggs and continue the life cycle. Um, as with everything in life, there's always exceptions. And it just so happens that one of the major ticks I'll talk about today, the ear tick, the spinous ear tick, the Tobias, is an exception to this. <laughs> it's actually a one host tick. Um, so with each of these different stages, they are actually feeding on different individuals potentially. But with the spinous ear tick, as the name suggests, they're living in the ear of an animal. So they don't actually come out of that um, ear canal until they've matured to a point they're gonna go into the environment and fully mature. So a couple of different groups of soft ticks. One of them is very much associated with birds, and they uh, oftentimes are found in coops. And so they come out, and you can see here they feed on birds when they're in the roost, and they're very messy feeders. They um, break the skin. There's a lot of bleeding. So not only are these ticks sucking a lot of blood from the animals, but they're also animals losing a lot of blood just because of the way the tick is feeding. Um, and so you can have weakness of these animals because they're losing a lot of blood. They can actually have paralysis. And then again, with wild birds, we can see some nest abandonment issues associated with bird sticks. Um, another group of soft ticks is the Ornithodora species. And this is really one of the more important ones for human and um, animal health because they also can be found in bird nests and cause abandonment, but they also transmit a number of important pathogens and so one of them is the relapsing fever Borrelia, um, and that's to people and dogs, that's, and, and then rodents are the reservoirs for those relapsing fever Borrelia. Um, this is primarily a problem in the western part of the country, but we do see some of those relapsing fever cases here in the east as well. And then we have a bacteria, um, P. abortivovis, um, that causes epizootic bovine abortion, again, predominantly in the western part of the country, uh, in California in particular. And so in those cases, you can have uh, abortion storms essentially associated with transmission of this bacteria by soft ticks to cattle. And then uh, somewhat everybody's favorite, but also um, thing of nightmares is the spinos ear tick. So Otobius uh, menigai, it is a quite large soft tick. Um, it is unusual compared to the others in that its cuticle is covered in spines. I'll show you a better picture of that in a second. And it lives in the ear canal of cattle, horses, sheep, goats, white-tailed deer, mule deer, uh, as well as domestic dogs and cats, and sometimes even people. Um, and so they can be very, very irritating. They can cause a lot of damage while they're feeding in the ear canal, and they can stay there for weeks to months. So here's a closer up picture of the spinos ear tick. And what you can't appreciate here really are all these little black spots here are those spines. So here's a mounted cleared specimen, and you can see all of those spines there. And what happens is the larvae and the nymphal stages feed in the same ear of the same host. And so instead of multiple hosts, like typical soft ticks, um, they're all on the same individual. That nymph will engorge, and you can see here it's engorged. It then falls off of that host, molts to an adult. The adults do not seek out a new host. They don't feed. They just mate, and then the females lay a clutch of eggs. So again, for um, this tick, it's predominantly a Western US issue, um, but we do see sporadic cases in the Eastern United States. Um, sometimes we even see it in deer or elk, but usually those are associated with translocation events. And then you can see here that Atobius is also found in many other parts of the world. And so with cattle and horses um, that have these ticks, if they just have a few ticks, they probably aren't going to have any issues. But as those tick numbers increase, so does the irritation and the damage. So those animals are going to be very restless. They're going to be using a lot of energy. Um, so that's going to redu reduce the weight gain and milk production. And on rare occasion, 
uh, you can have death associated with these ticks. The other thing they can do is cause a lot of damage in the ear canal that will just set them up for secondary infections, which could cause all sorts of other issues as well. So here's a picture of uh, a deer and we've cut away the ear here. So this white part is cut uh, ear tissue so that you can see down deep into the ear. Here's all these gray blobs. Those are individual ticks feeding. And then of course, all of this um, other material here is sloughed mucosa, dried up purulent material associated with these ticks and the damage they're doing. And then here's another look here and you can see the legs of these individual ticks. And so there's dozens and dozens um, or more of these ticks. They sort of just keep going down deeper and deeper into the ear canal. So you can imagine quite irritating. Um, in terms of what to do about these ticks, if you don't have a lot and your animals are amenable to it, you can manually remove them, but they are quite sensitive oftentimes, especially if they have high numbers. And so that may not be something that you can do. Also, you just can't simply do that on large numbers of animals. Uh, luckily, a large number of the products that are labeled for control of ticks will work against these ticks. And so you have options of ear tags or caricides or injectables. And we'll have some specific talks later on talking about ways in general that you can uh, treat or control ticks on livestock during later talks. Um, because these ticks do live in the environment for quite a long time, if you do have the ability to treat barns or remove areas where these ticks may be hiding in crevices in barns, uh, that would be ideal. All right, so that wraps up um, the soft tick section. And now we're gonna shift over to the hard ticks. And this is, again, the predominant types of ticks that we see in the United States. But right off the bat here, you can see when I put up the most common ticks that we have in the United States, um, native ones are being shown on the left, and we've got a couple of our exotic tick species on the right that'll have their own talks. Um, on the bottom here, these are larvae, and then these are nymphs in the second row, and then we've got adult males in the third row, and then adult females in this row, and then different levels of engorgement for those females. And so only the females engorge with blood because they're the ones taking up um, nutrition for production of eggs. But what I wanna highlight here is that each tick species looks different. And within each tick species, males and females look very different. Larvae and nymph look different. Um, but at the same time, when you start looking at larvae, they all sort of look the same. Um, and so I'll actually give a short talk tomorrow, just sort of talking about some complexities associated with identifying ticks. But what I wanna press upon you in this talk here is just that there is a huge diversity of ticks out there and they can look quite different, even if it's the same species. So these hard ticks, um, all of them, except for the cattle fever ticks that we'll talk about over the next two days are three host ticks. Meaning when you've got that larvae, that single nymphal stage and the adult stage, they feed on three different hosts. Those hosts could be the same species or they could be different species. It depends on the tick that you're talking about, um, but they feed on different individuals during each of those stages. So the larvae will feed on an individual host um, and then drop off into the environment where it will then live for weeks to months at which point it molts to a nymph, the second stage. That nymph will feed on a second host. It will engorge with blood, fall off, and then it will molt to an adult that then feeds on a third host. And so at each stage of that feeding, it could potentially pick up pathogens from those um, animals that it's feeding on, depending on the species. Um, but what's important here is that there's multiple opportunities to pick up pathogens. The cattle fever ticks, again, are an exception. They're a single host tick, and Denise will probably touch on that during her presentation. Um, but each of these times that these ticks are feeding, it's only for a couple of days or a week, maybe. Um, the, the rest of the time, so easily 95, probably 97% of the time of the tick's life cycle, they're living in the environment. So the environment is gonna be very, very important to, to, to determine whether or not ticks are gonna do well in an area. So each of the different tick species have different types of habitats that they prefer. Temperature, humidity, uh, and in particular, humidity is very important because ticks will um, be subject to desiccation. So they'll dry out if they don't have enough humidity in the air or in the leaf litter where they're living. And then temperature is important because that may dictate when those ticks are coming out looking for animals. 
So you can see over here, both temperature and humidity play into different um, abilities of the tick to survive throughout the winter or questing activity to find a host. And then of course the development. So on the warmer scale side of the scale, ticks may actually uh, molt faster uh, or lay more eggs than if they were on the cooler side. And then the time of year that ticks are active may vary slightly from year to year because of short-term weather patterns. So we talk a whole lot about how climate is important for ticks and how climate changing is impacting the distribution of ticks and activity of ticks. But we also can see annual variation in tick activity and numbers just based on uh, small scale weather patterns. So now I'm gonna start going through and just talking about some of our individual ticks. Um, if you're from the South, I know you guys are from all over the country, but if you're from the South Southeast, then here's the king and queen tick, the Lone Star tick, Anglium americanum named because the female has this white spot on her back, whereas the male does not. So you can see here, there are a huge diversity of pathogens associated with this tick um, and also the red meat allergy and the tick paralysis. This is a tick that is on the move. So back in the 90s, this would be the general distribution of this tick, but nowadays um, we can see that it goes all the way up to the north part of um, Iowa and even into Nebraska and all the way up into coastal parts of the Northeast. And really this is, it's just hard to keep current on this tick because it's marching north and northwest every year. Um, and you can see here when there was a study looking at the county level distribution of this tick and you can see that there are plenty of reports in Michigan, Wisconsin and Minnesota and all the way up into central Maine and northern New York. And I don't mean to leave Canada off, but this tick is increasingly being found in Canada as well, especially in the Ontario region. And so we're sharing, unfortunately, our ticks and their pathogens with our northern neighbor. All right, there's a whole bunch of different pathogens, but again, I'm just gonna sort of concentrate on a few select ones. Uh, the Lone Star tick transmits uh, a number of different Ehrlichia species. These are bacteria that live in our white blood cells and each one of them lives in a different um, white blood cell type. White-tailed deer are the primary host, so they maintain these pathogens in nature, and then the Lone Star Tick is the one that transmits it between deer and tick, and then sometimes to other people or animals. So for Ehrlichia chaffeensis, this can cause a mild to severe disease, can be fatal. Um, Panola Mountain Ehrlichia, so this doesn't have a formal designation. Um, if you're from Georgia, it's, it's a new species of Ehrlichia that was discovered in our backyard here in Panola Mountain State Park. Um, and so that's what it's called. But PME can infect goats and cause a mild febrile illness. And then all three of these Ehrlichia can infect dogs as well. But Ehrlichia ewing eye is the most significant. Of particular interest here, for Panola Mountain Ehrlichia, for me really, is that it's most closely related to Ehrlichia ruminantium, which is a causative agent of heart water agent, uh, a very important FAD for cattle um, and also white-tailed deer. And so um, when this was initially discovered in the United States, it was quite a concern given how closely related it was to Ehrlichia ruminantium, but thus far, no reports or issues associated with cattle and PME yet, just goats. But for cattle, there is an Ehrlichia in North America, Ehrlichia minicensis. Um, it was actually first discovered in Canada, the western part of Canada, and then it was quickly soon after that found in mule deer in the same area. And then subsequent surveys after that have found them in a number of different countries all over the world that you can see there. Uh, in Brazil, they've done an experimental transmission trial with uh, calves and calves did uh, develop clinical ehrlichiosis. They had fever, depression, lethargy, and low platelet counts. So pretty generalized um, disease in those calves. And um, to date, we don't know a vector for it, although it's been found in a, a number of different species and genera of ticks. So any number of these potentially could be vectors. Uh, it can be transmitted between the different stages of Ripocephalus microplus, which is the cattle fever tick. But um, so that suggests that tick could be a vector as well. But of note, um, the cattle fever tick is not found in a number of different places where this bacteria has been found in cattle. So it's certainly not the only vector. And that's about all we know about that one. Not a whole lot known. Um, something that's been making the news lately is Heartland virus. So this is a flebovirus. Um, 
and it is also associated with Lone Star Ticks. We're still in that group. Um, human cases in Missouri, Oklahoma, and Tennessee, a couple of those cases have been fatal. People present with a typical nondescript tick-borne um, uh, disease presentation, but there is no treatment. We recently found it in Georgia ticks. And then just to point out, it experimentally has been associated with transmission by the Asian longhorn tick as well. The Heartland virus has been found in a number of different wild animals, antibodies to it at least in 13 states, including all the way up into Maine. And at the time, it was thought that the Lone Star tick was the only vector. So these data suggested there could be other tick vectors. And so um, there's certainly a lot of interest in looking to see who else may transmit Heartland virus. And along the same time that Heartland virus was discovered in the Midwest, there was the Bourbon virus. That is actually the name of the virus, Bourbon virus. Um, and it's an orthomixaviridae virus. Cases in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri in people, one of those was fatal. And again, general flu-like symptoms. Antibodies have been detected in raccoons and deer. Um, and then there has been a detection of bourbon virus in an Asian lungworm tick as well. Now we move on to the derma center species. So there's a number of different derma centers in the United States. Just recently, the American dog tick, derma center variabilis, which was widespread in the eastern part of the country and then a little bit in the west, got split into two species. And so we have derma center similis in the west. And then we also have derma center andersoni and then ossidentalis. Um, all of these can be associated with pathogens of people and animals. And so they are concerned for sure. One of the big ones is Rocky Mountain spotted fever causes disease in both people and dogs, pretty high case fatality rate, um, 5-10%, uh, if not treated. What I'd like you to know is that the Rocky Mountain spotted fever is not actually all that common in the Rocky Mountains. It just happened to be where it was discovered, but the vast majority of cases occur in the Southeast and the Midwest. But recently, Arizona has um, seen a number of cases of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and in fact, associated with a different tick vector. So there's lots to learn for this one as well. Um, it's been experimentally shown that the Asian longhorn tick can transmit rickettsia rickettsii, which causes spotted fever, um, but um, it hasn't been found in the wild yet. And folks have been looking, um, and this is a different one, but we found rickettsia felis, in, uh, which is a related rickettsia in Asian longhorn ticks. Then we've got uh, the amblyoma maculatum, which is the Gulf Coast tick. So as the name suggests, this tick historically was restricted to the Gulf Coast uh, region. Uh, but as you can see by those orange arrows, it's showing that this tick is also one on the move and it has a number of different pathogens associated with it. But for livestock in particular, it causes what's called gotch ear. And so there's swelling and damage that's done to the ears and they have these drooping ears associated with the tick infestation of a wide diversity of livestock species. A little bit of interesting tidbit about this tick. Uh, this tick is not as impacted by low humidity as a lot of the other tick species. And so my lab's done a lot of work looking at the, the benefits of prescribed fire for tick control. Uh, and in that particular study, what we showed is that it did work really well against most ticks, but not actually the uh, Gulf Coast tick. It did quite well actually in the face of fire because it's, um, it does well in grassland systems. And then the big one, um, the black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis on the east and Ixodes specificus in the west. Uh, they are associated with a number of different pathogens, um, although not all of them are found everywhere. Um, there's a number of them that are found in the upper Midwest and the Northeast that aren't found in the Western part of the country. And again, Ixodes scapularis is another one of those ticks on the move, but I'll talk more about that later on. And so sort of the disease that everybody knows about Lyme disease, um, when they think about ticks, this is a rodent um, tick cycle. People think about deer a lot with Lyme disease, and while they are important, they maintain the ticks in the environment, but they don't necessarily maintain the pathogens. So you still need the rodents out there. And you can see from this map, most cases occur in the Northeast and Upper Midwest. Same goes for Anaplasma phagocytophilum. It has the same vector. Um, it also uses rodents as an intermediate host. So we see a similar distribution. But I will point out, this is not the same as anaplasma marginale that you'll hear about later on, uh, different anaplasma. And then the other thing I want to point out about anaplasma phagocytophilum is there are white-tailed deer, white deer variants. Uh, and so some of these strains can infect people and livestock and cause disease. 
and some of them cannot. And those deer associated ones don't seem to cause disease in other hosts. So experimentally, um, folks have tried to transmit both Borrelia burgdorferi and Anaplasma phagocytophilum with Asian longhorn ticks, but they did not work in the lab. But there have been rare reports of natural infections of these ticks in the wild with these pathogens. So we don't really know uh, what's going to happen with the Asian longhorn tick and these pathogens quite yet. Um, and then we've also found the deer adaptive strain of Aphagocytophilum in Asian longhorn ticks. All right, um, the next pathogen that we'll cover and is the last is Pallison virus. It's also associated with Exodes scapulaire, same tick vector here. It's a virus related to West Nile. Luckily, it's quite rare. You can see in this map here, just a handful of cases in different states in the Northeast, Upper Midwest. And that's a good thing because the case fatality rate can be quite high for Pallison virus. Um, and so we certainly want to keep those case numbers low. Uh, and unfortunately, there is some evidence that under laboratory conditions, the Asian longhorn tick can transmit this pathogen as well, which actually makes sense because in its native range, this tick vector can also transmit Pallison virus. All right, so now I want to switch gears a little bit and really make people in the, the room sad, but uh, uh, talk about a meat allergy associated with ticks. And of course, this is near and dear to my heart as a Southerner, but it's certainly near and dear to your heart as folks who are uh, interested in making sure people can buy and eat uh, various meat products. So historically, we were blaming the Lone Star tick, and it actually probably is the most important tick associated with this meat allergy, but there are certainly other ticks that could be uh, associated with this allergy. And this allergy is called alpha-gal. Um, and what happens is when you are being fed on by a tick, it injects a sugar called galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, or alpha-gal for short, um, and you become allergic to that tick. You essentially develop antibodies to it. Um, and unfortunately, that alpha-gal sugar protein is found on pretty much all non-primate mammalians. So humans and um, other primates don't have it. So you can safely eat you know, your friends and your neighbors if there's a desperate situation ever. Um, and then fish and poultry lack that sugar protein. So they're also safe to eat if you have this condition. But essentially all other mammalian uh, products are gonna be off the table. And that includes meat, dairy products, and even things that are derived from them like gelatin capsules. And so you have to be very particular about what medicines you take, make sure there's no gelatin or glycerin in them. So typically what happens with people is that two to six hours after eating meat or dairy or ingesting it, they're gonna have some type of symptom associated with it. And this is highly variable between different individuals. Some people just get a stomach ache. Some people have you know, diarrhea and vomiting. Other people start to develop hives. Sometimes people develop anaphylaxis shock. And in those cases, it can be quite life-threatening. And in fact, when you start looking at causes of anaphylaxis and presentation to emergency clinics, um, alpha-gal right now is one of the major reasons people present. So it's a big deal for sure. And then the other one, weird thing I was going to talk about was tick paralysis. And so just as the name suggests, uh, essentially the tick releases a toxin into your body while it's feeding that causes paralysis. Um, we do not know why certain individuals or certain species produce the toxin more so than others. Um, there's a lot of good data coming out now to try to understand that, but there's still a lot unknown. Um, the toxins are, are not well characterized. Some of them are, but um, others not so much. And then it's associated with a lot of different tick species all around the world. So the most severe one is going to be Exodes holocyclus, which is the actually the common name is paralysis tick in Australia. And it's important to um, livestock, wildlife, and humans. But here in North America, you can see there's a number of dermacenter species predominantly associated with it. But we can also see it with some of our other anglioma species. So essentially, probably any tick can do it. it just depends on whether or not they're producing a toxin. So what happens is as the tick is feeding, it releases that toxin that causes a, para a flaccid paralysis, um, and that animal or that person will develop incoordination. And then over time, if that tick continues to feed, it can cause complete paralysis and then ultimately death. Um, and we see this quite often in birds coming in here to squidus for diagnostics. We see a number of cases in dogs at the vet clinic down the hill. Um, and essentially what you do to diagnose it is find the tick and remove it. And then oftentimes within minutes or hours, you can see a response in that animal. 
Um, but with Exodes holocyclus, it can be days, it can take a while. Um, and the treatment really is, again, removing that tick and maybe supportive care. If you're in Australia, there is an antitoxin, but that antitoxin for Exodes holocyclus does not work against the tick paralysis caused by other species of ticks. And that's unfortunate because that we see it predominantly in the western part of the country and in Canada, uh, associated with dermis center species in our cattle. Now, with that, that was a whole lot of information about individual ticks and individual pathogens. And I know it's all just sloshing around in your head right now, um, but I want to take a moment to step back a bit and talk about the big picture. Um, essentially, what are all of these complex ecological and human derived factors associated with uh, tick ecology and tick borne disease epidemiology? One thing we preach um, from the Companion Animal Parasite Council, which I'm a board member of, this is more focused towards domestic animals. Um, I'm the tick expert on the board, but essentially we always talk about how parasites are dynamic and ever changing. So I've already spoke to you about several instances where ticks are expanding their range or new pathogens are being um, spread or introduced. So hopefully everybody is fully on board with that. But why exactly are we seeing all of these changes in tick numbers and tick pathogens? Well, I could sit here for hours again and talk about all of them, but I'll just quickly um, say that there are lots of different factors and those factors are gonna vary by the region um, and by the tick species. It's a lovely video of some ticks I collected in Spain last year. Um, very easy place to collect ticks. But some of the factors are gonna be changes in vector distribution and abundance. And I've already touched on that. Um, and that includes the introduction of exotic species, of course, which we'll hear more about in the next couple of days. Um, related to that would be changes in vertebrate host communities, because of course, without certain hosts, you're not gonna have certain tick species. So anything that impacts the vertebrate hosts are gonna be important. And both of these can be impacted by changes in land use and habitat. And all of that can be impacted by global climate change or regional climate change, not just weather patterns. Then we have changing demographics of people, maybe animals, um, increased risk of tick-borne diseases, and then better diagnostics. We have to always um, understand that we have a better ability to detect novel pathogens now than we ever have before. And so the more we look, of course, the more we're going to find. So sometimes it's hard to tease out, is this something that's always been here or is this something truly emerging? And again, all of these factors are not in isolation. They're going to impact each other. And all of this comes together to essentially um, alter our risk of ticks and tick-borne pathogens. And just to show you some numbers, um, in the United States, since 2004, we've seen a tripling of vector-borne pathogen cases. Um, and much of that was associated with ticks. And in particular, Lyme disease is a good example that's well studied. Um, you can see here that there's been a 300% increase in the number of Lyme disease cases in the northeastern United States, and about a 250% increase in the north central states. So crazy increases in tick-borne diseases in general in people, and in Lyme disease in particular. And not surprisingly, when we look at exodes, um, which are the vector for um, Lyme disease, you can see on the left in the mid 90s, the distribution of these two exodes, tick species, and on 2015, on the right, you can see a huge increase in the number of counties that have these ticks, predominantly for exodes scapularis in the east. Not surprisingly, um, when we look at Lyme disease in dogs, again, this is data that we gathered through CAPC and IDEX, you can see here that the distribution and the prevalence of Borrelia burgdorferi in dogs mimics very much the maps that I've showed you for people with lots of cases occurring in the Northeast and the upper Midwest. Um, and so this particular data set had more than 30 million tests. And so we are able through our um, contracts with IDEX to get on a monthly basis dog data coming in that essentially is updated monthly. And with human case data, it's oftentimes delayed by several years um, at best. And so it's a really good system to be able to inform tick uh, risks for humans and also to look at the changing ecology of these diseases. And I use this example really to just highlight that we can't ignore um, the One Health framework when looking at ticks and tick-borne diseases. So there's not one factor that's influencing them. There's not one host, there's not one environmental change, there's all of them interacting together. 
And so while it seems a little bit tangential to talk about Borrelia in dogs, um, it is quite relevant to human health. And so stepping through uh, this animation here, you can see cases starting in 2012 now, and then each year looking at the number, uh, the prevalence in dogs in subsequent years. And so obviously you can see that there's an intensification in the red, and there's also a spread in where we see those dark red counties, which is high prevalence areas. We can do all the statistics and actually show that statistically, we are seeing increases in uh, Borrelia burgdorferi exposure in dogs. So all of this red here would be significant increases. So that's a huge part of the country, even in areas where it was previously um, endemic. So New York, Pennsylvania, they've always had Lyme disease, but now they're still seeing more and more of it. And this is dogs. So we're all talking about dogs here, this data, but I wanna show you the human case data. So here we pulled from 2012 to 2016 at the county level, incidence rates for humans. And I'm not gonna bore you with all the math, but essentially what we did is we used our data from dogs and we um, compared it statistically to humans at the county level, so every single county. Um, and what we see is that they're very much associated with each other. And what we could then do is take that math and this is true for all states or just those really high Lyme endemic areas. We can take that uh, equation and from dog data only and then estimate where human cases are occurring and what the incidence rate of humans should be. So it's really cool. Um, it, the maps look very similar. The maps don't necessarily look all that much like what I showed you for dogs, but that's because there's a big lag in when we can get human data. So at the time of the study, it was back to 2016 versus 2019. When we look at the absolute numbers of difference per county, it really was only a couple. And so the dogs were really, really good at estimating human risk within a given area to the county level even. And so what we can do here now going forward is have dog data rolling in on a monthly basis and really use that as a, a way of estimating risk. Now, I'm done. So. I know that was a whole lot of information um, and it was a little bit of everything related to ticks and tick-borne pathogens, but a few things I wanna share with you is, first of all, I'm happy to share this talk. It's also being recorded. So you can go back and look at this and then I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the day today, um, but also via email if you like. We'll have individual talks focusing on Asian longhorn ticks and cattle fever ticks, individual pathogens of importance to you all as livestock producers, control strategies for ticks and livestock and then responses. And so I'm excited to open up um, the symposium with all of this other information that's gonna be coming over the next couple of hours and days. And later today, I'm still gonna be here and so we'll be available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Yavji, it was an amazing talk and a nice transition into um, what we're going to do next. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about cow fever ticks and um, I'm Denise Benia. I'm, um, I've got a few titles right now. I'm um, National Cattle Fever Tick Program uh, Eradication Program Coordinator. Um, I'm also a veterinary services entomologist with, at the USDA. Um, and, and temporarily, I'm the acting assistant, I'm in, uh, one of the acting assistant directors in our, in our Ruminant Health Center. So um, I'm happy to be here today um, among all these wonderful people who um, are giving you information on ticks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and the cattle fever tick uh, of the cattle fever tick program and, and background on cattle fever ticks. And, and then I'm going to transition into our program challenges um, and current treat and some of the current treatments that we use for these ticks. So here um, you've seen some pictures of them already in Dr. Yadley's talk, but here are um, Ripocephalus or um, what you might have heard what, as Buophilus annulatus and Ripocephalus or Buophilus um, microplus. And um, they are, as mentioned before, they're one host ticks, which means that they send, um, they don't drop from the host between the stages. So you'll see um, larvae and nymphs and um, adults all on the host. And then the engorged female will drop and actually um, lay eggs in the environment and those larvae that come from the eggs will find another host. So they're exotic to the United States and um, annulatus is 
really from um, southern Russia, near Middle East, Mediterranean Basin, and it came in about 1800 into the United States in the southern part of the U.S. And our risk level of microplus um, is native to India, and our, um, 1912 is when we first saw them in Key West, Florida. The reason we're interested in these ticks and we're talking to you about this today, and we have a, a quite a large program um, in South Texas, is that these ticks are vectors for, in other words, they can give um, Babesia bovis and Babesia gemina, which are two, which are the causative agents of two of a disease called bovine babesiosis to cattle is really what we worry about. So um, when I talk about cattle fever ticks throughout the talk, I'm talking about both of these species of, of ticks. Um, and let's kind of talk about you know, what, what happened historically. So this is the historical range of these ticks. Um, so that bottom blue area is the historical range. And, and really, that was, um, that was Blossolus annulatus. Really, what we have now um, is, is is more of a, a, a blockless microplus issue in South Texas. And so what happened when the program started is, if you go to the next slide, please, Michaela, um, is that we pushed this um, line of ticks all the way down to that little red line along the South Texas um, edge there. And so what we have now is what we call a permanent quarantine area in South Texas. And it runs from Del Rio to Brownsville. It's about 500 miles long. And, and there's no like actual line in the sand anywhere. Um, it, it basically, um, it varies. And, and it could be two tenths of a mile wide or it could be 10 miles wide. And the idea is that we understand that ticks are gonna get into, these ticks are gonna get into the US because they're, they're endemic in Mexico. But um, what we want to do is make sure that they don't spread out of this quarantine zone. And, and we work together, um, a cooperative program with Texas Animal Health Commission, to quarantine um, you know, premises that we know that are infested. And, and we also have um, import requirements and such. And I'll talk about those a little bit more late, later. I have to mention, too, that we do have cow fever ticks outside of Texas in the United States. The U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Guam also have cow fever ticks, but they don't have the program that I'm going to be discussing today, which is unique to, to South Texas um, and has quite a large workforce of over 100 folks working towards eradication of cow fever ticks there. So next slide. So this is kind of what it looks like. The red line is the cattle fever tick uh, permanent quarantine zone line. And the, and the stars are where we're seeing um, infestations um, pop up. And this is as of June, so um, we're a little, real, little delayed in, in getting the map. But um, this is pretty much what we see most of the time. We've got these um, counties that we have county offices in, and we've got um, this little pocket over here in the right-hand corner that you'll see in Willisley and Cameron County um, that are not really in our quarantine zone, but we have what we call a buffer zone because this, these are becoming more of an issue now. Um, and I'll go back to this little spot right here. So remember this corner in Cameron and Willisley County, because I'll talk about that in a few slides. Go ahead to the next one. Uh, just a close up, you can see that, you know, the infestations don't stay in the zone. They do wander into the free zone. Um, and those are, are definite ones that we want to um, eradicate as soon as possible. So next slide. And this is what a bad infestation of cow fever ticks looks like. You can see it can be quite, um, there can be a lot of ticks on an animal. So next slide. And, and our challenges, next slide, um, are, are many. <laughs> so as I mentioned, you know, we've got a river, um, whether you're, it, it's the Rio Grande or if you're from um, Mexico, it's, from, it's the Rio Bravo. And it, um, you know, in drought conditions, this river can be just a trickle um, down there on, on the border. And so when you've got, you know, it, it's not a good way to keep ticks and tick infested animals out of the U.S. Um, and so you can see movement back and forth of babesiosis and anaplasmosis, reservoirs um, like wildlife, like red deer and stuff that'll move across the river, um, and um, resistant ticks really to different pesticide groups will move in from the, the other side of the river. So we do have what we call tick riders, which are our uh, mounted patrol officers down on, that, for, that um, patrol the 
the border and pull in stray animals and they'll scratch them and and actually test um, take them to be um, tested for different pathogens um, and and a tick scratch basically is a is is a way to tell if there are ticks on the animals. We call it a scratch because that you basically run your hands across the animal to find if there's ticks on them or not. And they and so all of that happens, and they're at, and these strays that come across are apprehended pretty quickly by these folks that work the river. Next slide. So in Mexico, it's it's complicated there. Like I said, the ticks are endemic. We've got, um, which means that they're from the area and, and, and established in the area. We've got um, the Bisiosis and Anaplasmosis over there. Um, and what happens in Mexico is that every time they have a, an election, the resources for eradicating, um, getting rid of cattle fever ticks, just, they change. Um, there's changing priorities. Um, there's movement of livestock across the border, whether it's accidental or, or actually intentional. Um, there's um, free movement of wildlife hosts across the border um, because they don't just bite um, uh, cows, they bite other animals. Uh, we found that, you know, with cartel violence, that um, with, when drought is higher and cartel violence is higher, actually the infestations go up too. And so that's, that's you know, we have a, a farm that used to have people there and they no longer have people there because of whatever reason. And those animals move to where there's greenery and it may be across the river. And, and I spoke on pesticide resistance. And so we've seen that in, in the past three years that more than 60% of the Mexican origin um, animals that have crossed, the cows, um, they've had cattle fever ticks. It's, it, it's definitely happening. So next slide. And this is kind of a, a complicated way to say that there's multiple classes of pesticide resistance coming across. So when we, one of the things we like to use is permethrin because we can actually sell those, those animals can be sold right away. There's no withholding period for permethrin, but we're finding pretty widespread permethrin resistance. In other words, the ticks don't die when you use the permethrin. Um, and it's hard, kind of a little hard to see this this down here at the bottom, but you can. But basically, what it's saying is that, you know, back in the 80s, the other or the organophosphates that were used, another class of pesticides, um, we're seeing resistance. Um, or and then we saw pyrethroid resistance, and then we saw amidine resistance, and then we saw macrocyclic lactone resistance in, in Mexico. And so that right now about five different classes of pesticides um, and, and one tick can be um, resistant to multiple classes of pesticides at the same time. It's really hard to treat when you have that, these issues. So we're looking for different ways to do it. So next slide. And land use is changing in South Texas. Um, you know, we used to have these large cattle lands that were, were somewhat easy to treat, um, but they're being subdivided and some of them are no longer cattle lands. Some of them are exotic, exotic, um, exotic, they, they farm exotics. Um, also, we have a wildlife refuge down there in that corner that I spoke about and, and it, things have to be done differently on a refuge. You can't just, um, you can't treat the way that you would like, you maybe that you would like to, you have to be more creative and, and, and they have a different mission. And, so you have to work with stakeholders that um, may not feel the same way about treating the animals on the landscape that you do. So next slide. And wildlife play a huge part in this. Um, White-tailed deer are, are an alternate host for these ticks. And it used to be that you could vacate your pasture for uh, a while and you'd starve the ticks on the pasture, but if you have wildlife moving through that pasture, you're, they're picking up the ticks, they're depositing more ticks, you can't, you can't do that anymore. It's, it, it's possible, but improbable in, in the, the landscape right now. Um, and the exotics that we're looking at, you know, more and more are being brought into South Texas for hunting reasons. And you can see the list here in Nilgai or a big one, I'll talk about it more, but black buck, um, sheep, deer, different types of deer. Um, and the list goes on and on of different things that can actually feed these ticks 
that we weren't used to dealing with in the past. So next slide. And Nilgai, I mentioned, is a big one. Um, this is an Indian antelope that was brought in about 1920 for game hunting. Now, now there's just, um, there's, there's tons of Nilgai in South Texas and they're moving around um, and they're a great host for both of the cattle fever ticks. Um, and, and they've been moving on and off of refuge down in that corner of Willisee and Cameron County. And, and we've been working with Fish and Wildlife to um, hunt some of these, um, and and then the you know basically the meat is donated afterwards. Um, but when we did do that in 2019, 52% of these animals that were hunted were infested with cattle fever ticks. Um, the problem that makes them a little different than um, the white-tailed deer is that white-tailed deer will have you know a, a, a home range of maybe a couple miles at the most. These guys have incredibly large home ranges and will move miles and miles across the landscape and when they do that they take the ticks with them so it's this is a new um challenge we have on our plate so next slide and again let's look at that little corner there see all of those stars down there moving northward and 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 westward um from the mexico line is really Nilgai movement. That's what's driving that area over there. So next slide. So how do we deal with this? Um, there's a lot of different ways. We'll go to a, um, the next slide. Um, one of the ways that we're doing, um, trying to deal with the Nilgai movement is with putting up some game fences, which is, um, which we're, we've been, we've been trying to put up some, some to basically stop their movement. Um, uh, but we do have this tick attack force in Texas, and, and I mentioned we work with Texas Animal Health Commission. Um, we also work with our um, USDA Agricultural Research Service and to figure out some different ways to, to treat these animals and manage these animals that are tick infested um, and, and treat the actual ticks themselves. Um, we've got some of those folks on tomorrow that we'll be talking a little bit about treatment of cattle fever ticks, so I'm not going to cover that today. Um, and we have our tick force, like I said, over 100 folks, tick riders, um, very, very proud group. They're third and fourth generation folks that, that um, patrol the, um, basically the area along the river. And, um, and then they'll take the animals into the ports. The port veterinarians work very hard to help with that process. Plus, we have animals crossing over um legally from mexico and those animals are also treated and inspected and they're sent back if they have cattle fever ticks live cattle fever ticks um, and then a bunch of inspectors with texas animal health that work work with us cooperatively but really focus more on that free area outside of the quarantine zone whereas we focus more um, and then work we work together on on many things so next slide So some of the treatment options we currently have um, are, you probably have heard of Coral. It's, it's the trade name of Kumafos, and we do, and you'll see pictures of t t uh, basically tick dip bats that the animals will swim across um, and be treated. Um, and then some animals we actually will hand spray like horses and some cattle that don't fit in the, the vat. Um, thank, you, thank your longhorn steer. Um, so, um, or babies, and we'll hand spray them, and that will um, that will treat the tick. We also have something called Dormectin, which is an injectable, and that will last um, 21 to 28 days. Um, and that's um, that's basically a, a nice way to treat for a longer period of time because the tick dips and sprays with the Corel only last about 14 days. We have a preventative that we use on some of the premises that are not the actual infested premises, but the areas around those infested premises um, that we use molasses um, tubs and they have ivermectin in it. And that will, um, it's, a nice, it's a nice way to keep those, those fringe premises from um, getting infested. We also have a vaccine that works um, against these two different species of ticks. It works really well against Bluffless annulatus. 
and not quite as well as against Wealthless Microplus. So we're, we are using it along with the treatments that we have available, and we're looking for different ways to integrate it into an integrated tick management um, program, which uses a lot of different treatments um, in, in, a, in a schedule to, um, to get a better hold of those resistant ticks and, and getting them um, eradicated. So next slide. So with all of these challenges, it's really it's been, you know, in this hundred over a hundred year old program, um, it's it's time to innovate and to do some different things. One of the things that we've we've done is we've started working more with Mexico on projects that have, you know, that treat the problem at its source, wherever that might be. Um, and we have something we call the the real Bravo buffer zone project, which is um, we're working with um, with, with basically um, the, the states of Tamaulipas and Coahuila over in Mexico, and they're treating um, some areas on their side of the border where we see a lot of strays come across with cattle fever ticks. And so by them doing that, we're going to see if that somehow re reduces the amount of infestations we're getting on our side. So that's a, a new kind of out-of-the-box project. Um, and we're working with them on a bunch of other different projects, and we had some funding a few years ago that we gave to a bunch of partners on treatment and surveillance and dealing with wildlife reservoirs, and those projects are finishing up now, and we have a lot of, we're going to have a lot of good um, information coming out of those very soon. Um, and, and, and again, we work with ARS, and they'll talk tomorrow about some of their new things, but we also have non-ARS partners um, that work on cattle fever ticks. Um, and, and all the different things that come with, with cattle fever ticks. So, next slide. So, I have to thank you guys for being here today and being patient with us on our technological problems. But we, we also um, have a lot of other folks that uh, may not be here today that are really important in, in cattle fever tick eradication and control. Um, so, I want to thank them. And with that, um, I think we can move on to Asian longhorn tick. All right. So I am still the same person. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to give you some, I, some kind of the, the pulse of Asian longhorn tick in the United States right now. And, and Dr. Yasley discussed this tick a little bit in his intro. Um, but specifically, you know, we're talking about um, Asian longhorn tick, which is Hemophysalis longicornis, and um, we originally saw it in Northeast Asia, and, and it expanded into Australia and New Zealand, and it's actually got two races of ticks. Um, it's got this uh, bisexual race, with, and it's got what we call a parthenogenetic race, and so the idea with the, the, the bisexual race is kind of like other ticks, the normal three-host tick. Um, the parthenogenetic strain basically means that there's a deviation in the life, the life cycle of this tick in which the female no longer has to mate with a male. So the, when that happens, the time that it would normally take for her to go out and find a male um, and actually mate is no longer there. So we've got a much quicker life cycle in this situation. Um, in which we get these pretty big, quick, massive um, amounts of ticks in a short period of time. Um, and it seems that this parthenogenic strain is the one that has expanded into Australia, New Zealand, and, and, and now here in the United States. The other issue that we have with it is that um, it just, throughout the world, it just vectors all kinds of different protozoal, bacterial, and viral pathogens. So um, you get an idea of it from the picture here. Um, it, it's, it's not a huge tick. It's not a terribly small tick. It's about, about the size of our um, deer ticks. Um, looks a little different. Um, supposedly walks a little different, I've heard um, people say that they thought it, it looked a little more spidery. Um, and so with that, let's go to that second, uh, that next slide and we'll talk a little bit more about it. So back in 2017, we, um, we heard that in New Jersey um, that a woman had gone into her local vector control agency and started complaining about ticks. Um, 
And actually, they were a mosquito control group, but the entomologist there had knew quite a bit about ticks, and and from what she was saying, realized that it wasn't, you know, this tick didn't sound really like something that um, was normal in that area. So, you know, she came in another time, and and she had just had ticks all over her all over her clothes, and they went out and they checked it out, and and indeed, um, especially the sheep that was in the paddock had a large amount of of ticks. And not only did it have a large amount of ticks, but it had a large amount of different stages of a tick. And so long story short, we, we, we found out um, as a group that this was Haemophysalis longicornis, or the Asian longhorn tick. Um, this is the first time that this tick was found outside one of our quarantine facilities, where we do find this occasionally. Um, and it was pretty well infested, this, this, um, this one, premises. And so we wanted to know if it was just that one or if it was the area. We thought it was just New Jersey for a while. This is one area of New Jersey and we found out. Um, we learned a lot since then. It, it, we found out that it's definitely just not that spot, which we thought we would eradicate and move on. And, and it, that wasn't the story. So next slide. So as you see this map here, um, these, are, these are confirmed positive of the Asian longhorn tick in the United States. So, you know, we're basically adding on in on the eastern seaboard right now and somewhere some into the Midwest. And then when we started looking at the tick and looking at what we had in the archives, um, this tick looks a lot like some of the other ticks we have, like the rabbit tick. And so we started as a group, um, our stakeholders who were involved in this started pulling out their specimens again and looking at them. And actually, our National Veterinary Services Laboratories pulled out a specimen and, and looked at it again and thought that they thought were rabbit tick, was, was a rabbit tick, and indeed it was uh, an Asian longhorn tick. So back to 2010 now was the first time that, you know, we had ticks in archives that were this tick. So we backdated it, and that was um, a, a larval tick that came off of a deer in, in West Virginia. Um, so now we've got 17 states. That are, that are infested that we know of. Um, and Virginia is leading that count with 38 inf known infested um, counties right now. So that's a county count. Um, and so we um, definitely are kind of filling in the map at that point. The different colors in the map are just different ways that we um, look at, you know, how the, the, the tick infestation was confirmed. Um, we ask that when, when there's a when people will first ID a tick, that they get a secondary ID um, to make sure that indeed it is that tick because they do look very different, very very similar as, especially as, as immatures. And so that's just what that coloration is. So again, 17 states, um, and the most, most recent ones being Georgia and South Carolina, Missouri, um, Ohio, um, and, and then back into uh, Rhode Island. So next slide. So just because the, you know, it, maybe it's maybe a little misleading, you know, the number of counties in Virginia had 38, but um, you have to kind of take into consideration how many total counties are in the are in the state. So Delaware having only three counties and all three counties being infested have 100% of their counties infested. So this gives you an idea here. You can take a look at your state and see right now um, to to date, you know, how how, what the percentage is of infestation in the counties in your, um, in your state. So, um, and, and down here in Georgia, you know, there's just, there's, there's three infested counties right now, um, but there's 159 counties to go. So um, it's possible that that, they, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ch chance that this tick can, potentially move into new areas and invest new areas. Um, next slide. Next slide. And we're finding that the that Asian longhorn ticks will infest a lot of different animals. So here are some of our wildlife infestations. And these are just numbers that were reported to us. These aren't tick counts. These are actual individual animals that are infested. 
So we're definitely seeing, it gives you a roundabout idea of kind of what, what, what is out there and what can be infested by this tick. And so deer are definitely pretty high on the list um, and can move the tick around raccoons, opossums, um, and then the fox. We've got two different foxes, um, rabbits, groundhogs, skunks, um, mice. And, and the mice are important for other three host ticks. Um, in, in the transmission of Lyme disease, like Dr. Yowsley had said earlier, but not so much in this one. They don't really like mice, but they will infest them. Um, and so um, this is just kind of a snapshot of what's going out in the wild when these three host ticks are out there feeding um, in, in the environment. So next slide. And we do have infestations on birds. now. There's been a lot of birds that are not on this list and that we're, we didn't, we never found infested. But we have found infestations on hawk, on red-tailed hawks, owls, geese. Um, that last one was brown booby. That's that that animal um, kind of towards the middle down there with the yellow feet. Um, and and these animals migrate, so they're moving. These birds are moving this tick around. Um, just because we know that that they are infested they have to be moving ticks around so we that's important to note um, that it can be spread because of the movement of animals so next slide and then we we have to think about people and their animals so um the, i guess if there's good news it's that um the ticks don't really like humans, but they will infest, they will bite humans. Um, and it seems that the, the we're getting a lot of um, reports of larval ticks on, on kids, you know, that are playing basically in their backyard or, or, or parks or whatever, um, that will pick up larval ticks that will bite them. But we see a lot in dogs. Um, and it's possible that um, you know, dogs are actually moving these ticks around with people's travel. Um, and so we don't know that for sure. But we do know when it comes to the introduction of this tick, is it's actually not a whole lot. Um, and, and we're trying to get a feel of how they move around. What we do know is that we don't know where it came from at this point, our introduction. But what we do know is that when you look at the genetics of these ticks that have been found throughout the U.S., we know there's been at least three introductions of this tick into the United States. So it, you can't point at you know, a certain state or a certain area and say, this is where it started. We have no idea at this point um, really what, when, when it happened, when the first one happened, but we know it's happened multiple times at this point. So um, and important to a lot of the folks here, cows are, are one of the, seem to be one of the favorite hosts for these ticks. But they will, we do have, we have filled in kind of our livestock commodities at this point. They'll, they've, we found these ticks on sheep and goats and um, pigs now. Um, and so as a, as a producer of whatever commodity, um, you need to be on the lookout for these ticks. So next slide. And this is one of the issues. This is about feeding and mass that I told you um, about. And so these big populations, you can just see there's ticks, just tons of ticks in these animals, on these animals that have died. Um, and so they can die from exsanguination, which means, basically means that the tick feeds to the point that it drains the animal and they can't live anymore. And we've seen situations like this that um, they don't, the animals don't seem to be sick from something else. Um, they just seem to have thousands and thousands of ticks on them. And so that, we've seen situations like that in Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, Kentucky, Ohio. I know it's happening in other places. Um, and it's happening on other animals besides cattle. It, it, you've, we've got a, a report that it could have potentially, I saw a report potentially that um, a fawn, this could have happened to a deer the other day. It's, it's it could be happening in multiple places and at, on multiple species. So next slide. And I think 
Dr. Yabsley spoke about this a little bit in his last talk, but you know, looking at the the pathogens that this this or what causes disease, um, we're seeing you know that in the lab it doesn't really do a good job in the lab of Lyme disease or human granulocytic lymphoplasmosis or tularemia. So good news, but it does in the lab um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever and Tylero and Talus Lykeida, which causes cattle teleriosis, have been found um, in the to do this tick does and transmit those in the lab. And, and there'll be more discussion on those later, um, especially Tylerio and Talus Aikida. So next slide. And out in the field, we've seen positive, um, Dr. Yashley, so, so cattle tyleriosis, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, uh, bourbon virus. Next slide. And unfortunately, the like I said, there's just a lot of room for growth of this tick. So we want to make sure that through like talks like we're having in the next few days, that you're very well educated as to what you could possibly do to stem the movement of this tick. Because when you look at this map that is basically a model, uh, a set, actually many models that were put together when you look at, you know, other parts of the world where this tick is found, and you look at what, where the things here, the ecological things like temperature and, and vegetation and things like that. Um, you remember the map that we had earlier that was just down that eastern seaboard and some of the few of the Midwest states. If you look at the red area on here, they're they're estimating that these are perfectly good areas that Asian longhorn tick could live. So just because you didn't see your state or county outlined before and or or colored before. It doesn't mean that you're not at risk of getting this tick where you live. So, um, next slide. So, um, I'm not going to go a lot over treatment options. We are going to talk about that tomorrow. But, right, the good news is we haven't seen any pesticide resistance here. And you can, if you're worried about yourself, um, you can use EPA uh, approved repellents um, or treatments. And, and, and things that are labeled for ticks in the United States for your animals or the environment, it may not say Asian longhorn tick on them, but they still work for this tick. So, um, and and we'll talk later about um, treatments and, and habit management, but it, it, keep in mind, you guys, that whenever you're out with your animals or whenever you're out, you know, hiking or even in the yard, there's a chance of getting ticks. So make sure you check yourself, you check your family, you check your animals and stay on top of, of pulling those ticks off um, as soon as you possibly can. So, next slide. Um, and we do have some USDA resources. Um, if you can't find that, if you can't copy down that link down there, you can basically go into Google and you can type in USDA um, vector borne diseases, and this will it'll come up, and you can use these uh, fact sheets. And, and and read through some of our guidance, including a situation report that we put out monthly. Um, and we have a really nice story map that has pictures and, and you have with links in links within and, and kind of explains the story behind Asian malform ticks. So um, next slide. So that's it. Um, sorry again about the technology issues. Um, we're gonna have some questions and answers at the end of the day. Um, so I'll be around for any questions you might have on cattle fever ticks or Asian longhorn tick. Um, and with that, we're going to go to a break right now um, until 45 after the hour, in which we'll come back and, and Matthew Playford will, will take over and tell us a little bit about um, Asian longhorn tick from established countries. And, and he's from Australia, so we're super excited to have him here with us today. So. Um, all right. Um, welcome back. I hope you uh, were able to take a quick break. And um, at this point, we're extremely excited to have Dr. Matthew Playford. Um, he's a veterinary consultant and managing director of, at Dawbus and and I believe it's Sydney, Australia. And so he's going to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, what what happens in other parts of the world with Asian longhorn tick and how they're dealing with it. So I'll hand it over to him and, and, and thank you, Dr. Playford, for being here. 
Thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction. Hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, look. Um, just by way of uh, introduction, I'll um, I'll take you through some of the experiences we've had in Australia, and I'll just um, link that to our experiences in Japan and also some in New Zealand as well. So you're probably familiar with the Sydney Opera House. Um, our lab is located about uh, 40 miles from Sydney Opera House in the southwestern part of Sydney in the state of New South Wales. And we have a veterinary parasitology lab there, a private lab that services cattle, sheep and goat producers throughout Australia. We do a lot of um, resistance testing, particularly for internal parasites and liver fluke. However, um, my journey started in Hokkaido in Japan. I first went there in 1979 when I was a high school student. And I went back there for uh, veterinary practical work, working in a large animal practice, uh, servicing mostly dairy and some beef farms, and then did my um, PhD at the University of Hokkaido, which is uh, pictured here in the veterinary parasitology department. Now they do have a lot of um, problems with tyleriosis in Japan and uh, we studied it um, in our lab and on farms uh, in Hokkaido. The situation with Asian longhorn tick in Japan is very interesting. Now this survey was actually done using dogs because um, as Dr. Yabsley has um, indicated, dogs are a very convenient way of studying different uh, different vectors and also parasites. But the situation in Japan is that above a certain um, uh, line, which I've indicated in that uh, in the in the the top red line there, there are no Asian longhorn ticks. They're not found up in the cold, frigid, snowy areas of Hokkaido. In the uh, in the in the middle area, we find the the female ticks, or occasionally you'll find a male, maybe once every 400 ticks. But this is the 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 ticks that uh, Dr. Bonilla described as the parthenogenetic tick. They're the ones that don't need males to reproduce, and they're found in that colder northern area of the mainland. Uh, of Japan, and then down south, they have male and female ticks, quite a quite um, uh, mixed populations with lots of males as well. And so we have very distinct populations um, of ticks that uh, differ biologically as you move throughout Japan. Now we'll return to the um, the implications of this at a, as a later date, but I just wanted to establish that benchmark, we're dealing with a very diverse um, uh, biological uh, array of ticks, even within this one species. The other thing that's worth pointing out is that in Hokkaido, the vectors for tyleriosis, the, um, the bloodborne disease, are other ticks. And this, this could happen uh, in the USA as well where the, um, the pathogen, the actual parasite, the um, protozoan parasite may be taken up by some of your other ticks. Now look, let's look at the history of tyleriosis around the world. Of course, we've got some major diseases in Africa, uh, East Coast fever and tyleria annulata, which is uh, usually called tropical tyleriosis. And they really don't have much in common with the, um, the disease caused by uh, what used to be called Tyleria sargenti. Now, about 120 years ago, the uh, Asian longhorn ticks were first discovered in Australia. They're not a native tick to Australia. They were brought to Australia, probably from Japan. And the, the link isn't, um, isn't established by genetic analysis. It's actually simply due to the fact that our ticks are also almost all females. Uh, we, we occasionally get a male, but it's only a very small part of the population. So our ticks are also this parthenogenetic race. And the ticks established in Australia and spread 
up and down into the um, into the favoured areas. Now they also at that time had a benign strain of Tyleria sargenti, which has more recently been renamed Tyleria orientalis. Uh, the ticks then spread to New Zealand and later on the uh, Tyleria um, spread to New Zealand. And it's only recently we've found that um, this uh, major outbreak has occurred on the east coast of the USA. But as we look around the world, there are other uh, benign strains of uh, Tyleriosis found in Africa, uh, in Europe and in other places in the world. Okay, so what we do know about um, the disease in Australia is that both the ticks and the benign Tyleria have been in Australia for 120 years. There's been a lot of uh, academic study and it's fairly well characterised. However, there's a new outbreak relating to the Ikeda strain just in the past 20 years. This is a... Uh, a map of the state of New South Wales. You can see on the eastern seaboard, um, Sydney is right in the middle. And just for scale from top to bottom of the map is about a thousand miles. Now by uh, December 2011, the, um, the, uh, the distribution of the Ikeda strain had spread to all of these different places. Now it particularly started uh, on the north coast of New South Wales in an area there around uh, what's called Gloucester and it spread south, north and west from there. And just to um, just to give you some clarity, the, the western area there where it says western LHPA is an arid zone and then we have high rainfall along the, um, the coastline. And so we can say that the, the ticks really do prefer those uh, moist, warm conditions and they will not establish permanent populations out in the drier areas. And so we do have some uh, relief from, uh, from the ticks in the, in the western arid areas. But of course, uh, those areas aren't too friendly for cattle and um, we have very low stocking rates in those areas as well. Now, one, one problem that we do have with Tyleria is that most of our animal health funding is arranged through uh, state-based authorities. And so we don't have great communications between states. And so you'll see that um, each state is very good at managing their own um, disease outbreaks and resources, but not that great at sharing it. And so it's um, not until we get up to major diseases, particularly exotic diseases, that they are handled by a national authority, which in this case is Animal Health Australia. But we've established that the disease uh, Ikeda has spread using the, the ticks that were already there, already well characterised, already well described, up and down throughout New South Wales, and it caused major diseases started in that area, spread south, spread north, and then eventually started to spread west. Now it only spread west when the weather conditions allowed. In the state immediately to the south of New South Wales, and just for um, uh, um, clarity, it's about 300 miles from top to bottom. We see that there was, uh, over the space of three years, a very um, clearly defined outbreak started from a point source and it spread through multiple introductions into other areas and spread around the state everywhere where these ticks were found. Uh, here's a case study and I know I'm speaking to beef producers but um, uh, this is the, the token um, photograph of the black and white cow northern Victoria. So it's on the on the front line from where all the outbreaks had been occurring up until 2011. They decided to go over to dairy cows. So they converted, they sold off all the beef cattle, converted to dairy, and they started to bring in cattle from all parts of uh, New South Wales as well as Victoria. They ended up buying in 430 cattle. They inadvertently brought in ticks and the Ikeda strain Within a few weeks, uh, cattle, particularly 
those that were on the point of calving started having abortions, they were recumbent, they showed weakness, anemia and death. Now that continued and over the next six months there was a total of 80 abortions, 30 head of cattle died, 100 head had chronic illness including uh, metritis and mastitis and that particular outbreak on that one farm ended up costing about one million dollars Australian. Now the economics um, were estimated by Meat and Livestock Australia in 2015 and again in 2022 and nationally the costs of tuileriosis are estimated at about 18 million dollars. Now that's um, that's uh, probably a, an important figure to establish as a benchmark because even though we have um, occasional outbreaks still, the disease appears to have stabilised. It's certainly got no worse since 20, uh, 2015 when the um, first financial estimate was made. And the number of outbreaks, although um, they are fairly, uh, fairly stable as well, um, they don't appear to be any worse than they were uh, back in 2011. So this is the tick we're dealing with and um, I think you've already been given a, a very good rundown from uh, Dr Bonilla on the, on the details of the tick. It's fairly easy to identify because of its uh, physical characteristics and we need to distinguish it in Australia from all of our other ticks. But probably the bottom line when we're talking to producers about um, this tick is that it's often on cattle without it being noticed because the, um, the unfed stages are very small. They're only a few millimetres across the size of a pinhead. The other thing that's um, apparent about it is that ticks will appear on cattle very shortly after they have been treated. Because it's a three host tick, they will become reinfested and they are of course quite happy to hop onto dogs or people or other wildlife. We do find that they tend to overwinter as larvae, as nymphs and that we have most of our um, outbreaks occurring in the spring. And the other critical thing about the um, infection with Tyleria is that it is transstadial, it will be um, transferred between uh, for example, the larva, larva to the nymph to the adult, but not transovarial. So when the adult female lays eggs, they do not contain Tyleria. Now the other common ticks that we find in cattle are the cattle fever tick, which we call cattle tick on the left there. Um, Hemaphysalis in the middle, we call the bush tick, and then the paralysis tick, uh, Dr. Yavsley mentioned already, Ixodes holocyclus. And that, that may seem like a, a small harmless tick, but um, it'll quite happily kill a, a horse or a, or a cattle beast. So from that introduction, maybe 120 years ago, this, um, this uh, particular tick, this Asian longhorn tick has spread all up and down the Eastern seaboard. And that covers a, an area of maybe 3000 miles. From, uh, from north to south and uh, it comes inland in those times when the weather conditions suit. It's also found in Western Australia, you can see down in the, uh, the southwest portion of Australia and we do have uh, Tylerios cattle in that area as well. So this is the life cycle as we see it in Australia. So you know, a few of the, the ground rules about this tick, it is very different from the ticks with which we're more familiar. The adult ticks are, are very small, only three millimetres when they climb on board the cattle and then they grow up to about eight millimetres, uh, maybe a centimetre long. Then they drop to the ground, they lay 3,000 eggs. The larvae can survive a really long time on the grass, so they don't need to climb back aboard the cattle. And it's only once they get onto an infected beast that they become themselves infected. And then they will quite happily rest on the ground until they, uh, till they uh, find another host that can be wildlife, 
and in Australia, of course, wallabies, wombats, and kangaroos are frequently implicated as uh, as wildlife hosts. Then the larvae turn into nymphs, climb aboard the cattle, and we find that this is often the stage that causes the most damage to our livestock because um, they'll climb one in large numbers and give big doses of tyleria, uh, particularly to young cattle, and uh, cause the diseases that have been described. Now it is possible to get mechanical transfer. You can pull blood from an infected animal and use that to infect other animals. And um, this is uh, a, a particular issue when we're vaccinating cattle or treating them uh, with um, uh, endecticides uh, to prevent ticks. And we've also found it in um, creatures like uh, sucking lice. And this has also been described in Japan. So those uh, academic papers that describe those findings have been published. Um, this one is open access in parasites and vectors. That's a, an easy one to, uh, to look up. And um, you can see some of the, the main researchers in Australia, Professor Emery, Cheryl Jenkins, Daniel Bogomer, and Jade Hammer have contributed a lot to our knowledge. And then more recently, um, research conducted at the University of New England in Armidale in New South Wales has have shown there's a potential role for transmission, particularly by those biting lice. I think they, uh, they're capable of, oh, sorry, the sucking lice, they're capable of, of ingesting a lot of uh, infected blood and potentially transferring it to other animals, but they're not a biological vector. They're not capable of completing the life cycle of tyleria. They're just a mechanical means of transmitting infection. Our diagnostics really does rely these days on uh, polymerase chain reaction, the molecular methods. And that's very handy because it is uh, semi-quantitative and it also identifies the different types. Now, um, in every population of Tyleria, the amount of Ikeda, which is the most pathogenic strain, varies a lot. And so it's good to know and confirm that the Ikeda strain is present. The cost of that test is $61, which in US dollars would be about $40 per test. Now, of course, it's also possible to diagnose this disease simply using a blood smear where we see the characteristic shapes within the red blood cells or on suspicion uh, when we see clinical signs and ticks on cattle um, there are um, telltale signs and we also have an ELISA test but it's only used in research not for uh, clinical diagnosis. So the color of the uh, mucosa of the vulva is, a, is a, a bit of a telltale sign. This, this beast died from um, tyleriosis with severe anemia. And you can see the color has gone from the normal pink color to uh, a pale uh, and possibly jaundiced color. Now in New Zealand, they have actually constructed a, a chart showing the link between the color of the mucosa of the vulva to uh, and linking that with the packed cell volume uh, or the hematocrit of the animals. Now we know that in a, in a normal um, in, in a normal cow, the red blood cells make up about you know 35 to 40 percent of the circulating blood volume. And as those red blood cells are destroyed due to the tyleria infection. Um, the uh, the packed cell volume decreases, and by the time the animal gets down to about 10% red blood cells in the blood, then they are very pale. And so we can grade the severity of the anemia in the clinically affected animal by using this chart. Now, once an animal gets down to 10% uh, packed cell volume or less, then they are at a very high risk of dying and they really shouldn't be given um, any, any chance to exercise. They should be confined 
and uh, it's very common in New Zealand and Australia to treat these animals with a blood transfusion. There's nothing that we have that can be used to directly treat the tyleria and it's probably a moot point by this stage because they really just need intensive care. So the tyleria in the red blood cells are visible as, um, uh, as, as small dark shapes and by, that, by the stage you're seeing that a lot of them, there's usually some level of clinical disease. And just emphasizing, so the blood smears, they do take uh, slightly different shapes at different stages, but they're uh, easily distinguishable um, in a veterinary lab from other diseases such as anaplasmosis and babesiosis. Now, just looking at the types of tyleria that we see in Australia, I uh, mentioned before, we've got the Ikeda strain. Uh, Chitose strain, which is another very common one, was uh, first identified in Australia in 1995. But the most common one we've had historically is um, Buffali. And it's been in Australia probably for as long as the, the Asian longhorn ticks have been, probably 120 years. Now there are other types available uh, that are that are diagnosed using um, uh, polymerase chain reaction, but they're not of a huge amount of interest to us. And I'll just mention that um, the the buffalo strain, which is is quite common, particularly in Queensland, uh, has potential as um, being used as a, a live vaccine strain although the, uh, the development is still in the early stages. Here's another case study from New South Wales. Now this is what we call an endemic area. That means that um, almost all the cattle are exposed to ticks from a very early age and they are given tyleriosis from a very early age. Now they start to look poor, they, uh, they have um, uh, poor health around two months of age and that can be mapped to their packed cell volume. So animals in endemic areas are born with quite normal um, blood parameters and then the packed cell volume starts to decrease and it reaches its nadir, the lowest point at around um, two months up to four months of age. So they have slight anemia, they have slow growth rates and they're very susceptible to other diseases such as uh, pneumonia and coccidiosis, uh, pink eye, other calf foot diseases. And there has been um, up to 10% mortality rate recorded in these endemic areas. And on top of that, a 20 kilogram weight difference between um, cattle that are affected and those that, uh, that aren't. So it's not all bad news. We do have opportunities for uh, bush tick or Asian longhorn tick and tyleriosis control. And it really revolves around these five things. Managing pastures using ticicides, uh, care when transporting cattle, monitoring the introduced cattle and nutrition nursing for calves. And when we talk about pasture management, this is a, the type of pasture where it's almost a, a dry lot, cattle are fed um, a hay and, uh, and hard feed. And it's almost impossible to imagine these cattle getting any, any sort of ticks or tyleriosis because it's not good habitat for the ticks. And then we go through a bit of a gradation. Of course, the ticks will survive quite happily here. Uh, particularly if you have incursions of wildlife that are carrying them right up to this is my neighbor's place up where I live in uh, in Razorback in New South Wales and there's a lot of trees a lot of bush and it's uh, it's prime areas for uh, the survival of ticks so these cattle are most at risk so managing those pastures and keeping your most vulnerable cattle away from the pastures that are close to forests, that are frequent, frequented by wildlife, or have uh, a lot of dry matter, uh, will help them um, not totally avoid uh, tyleriasis, but it will uh, modulate 
the amount of dose that they get and so prevent them from getting a fatal dose. And in Australia, we found that um, cattle that get maybe one or two ticks and get a small dose of tularia will most likely survive it and become immune. Cattle that get um, dozens or hundreds of ticks and get a big dose of tularia are much more likely to succumb. Now I'm going to talk about tick asides and I have to just put up this disclaimer, all the product claims and directions are made in the context of the Australian market. So please um, read the label on your local products and use them uh, according to the directions from your experts. Now we've divided them into three main areas. The green products are the ones that have a claim against bush tick or Asian longhorn tick. The orange ones are frequently used and the red ones, we've got some hope for the future for those products. So first of all, the most, um, most commonly used or recommended product are synthetic pyrethroids and this is uh, flumethrin in an aqueous formulation and also delta methrin in a solvent based or an aqueous formulation and there claim to have protection from these ticks for up to 10 days. They're quite effective at killing the ticks and because they're a three host tick we have no resistance detected in Australia to these ticks. Now just as an aside this particular product is used in New Zealand and Japan as their mainstay against Asian longhorn ticks and that's a pour on formulation, a solvent based formulation of flumethrin and that will last between three and six weeks depending on the infection pressure. And so that's probably, we don't have this in Australia due to um, the fact that it's not registered, but in other countries, this is their go-to product. This is the one that's found to, to work the best. You also have organophosphates. Um, this one particular one is chlorphenvinfos and also includes cypermethrin and um, it claims to keep ticks off for about 14 days. And this old favourite Amitraz, which um, even though it's quite effective at killing the ticks, and we, we use it a lot for the cattle fever tick, um, doesn't have any residual effect and so the ticks can reinfest very soon after this is used. The, uh, the most popular products in Australia for internal and external parasites are the mectins and particularly products like Cydectin Poron and as Dr. Bonilla mentioned, Dectamax injectable, they're, they're quite effective but they do not have a label claim for Asian longhorn ticks. We're just piggybacking their use off the uh, established claims for uh, cattle fever ticks. Okay, now transporting cattle um, is problematic because most of the outbreaks that we find these days uh, found in uh, transported cattle and we can pretty much divide cattle into two groups. The naive cattle, cattle that have never been exposed to um, uh, tularia because they live in an area where there's not many ticks and that would be the case for um, a lot of uh, beef cattle in the United States. And then we have cattle in endemic areas and this is, um, this is actually the, the hills in the background is the Razorback range and this is the um, cow pastures region around Camden where there are a lot of ticks and the cattle are exposed to the disease at a young age and they're unlikely to develop any, any uh, infection or clinical disease. So when we're transporting cattle we've got ticky to free area transport, free to ticky area, free to free or ticky to ticky. When we're transporting cattle from ticky to free areas, those cattle will likely carry ticks and infection and infect the cattle at the destination. So the cattle in the destination are at risk. Conversely, when we're transporting cattle from free to ticky areas, it's the cattle that you're transporting themselves that are most at risk of developing clinical disease. And when we're transporting cattle from free to free or ticky to ticky, there's not much risk at all. I hope that's clear. So when you introduce cattle, and uh, in Australia we do have uh, a lot of uh, tropical cattle in our uh, tropical northern areas, 
then you need to monitor them because they can go downhill very quickly and that can happen any time from uh, two weeks uh, post introduction um, up to uh, several months later. And it may be that it's when they're on the point of calving, when they're about to uh, go through the most metabolically stressful period that they start to show clinical disease. Uh, similarly with calves, we find that um, they are quite susceptible, uh, particularly in areas where there is very high tick pressure and seasons such as springtime and over early summer when the tick numbers seem to be at their greatest that we get um, disease in calves in the endemic areas. So they're the two major syndromes we see. A role of sheep in transmission has been examined in New Zealand and there are um, published papers on that for your academics to, to study and uh, try and work out if sheep are going to be a problem. In Australia, we, uh, we really don't see any um, uh, any material difference in in places where there are sheep compared to where they aren't. So just in summary, our extension message for producers is uh, use um, tick control with acaricides, with tick ticicide treatment in spring summer to prevent the buildup of numbers on cattle uh, using products that work in your area. Uh, you can use pasture management to reduce the risky habitat and particularly to restrict uh, the most susceptible uh, members of the herd, particularly the, the calves that have been never previously exposed to those high risk um, uh, paddocks. Manage the calves carefully during that critical two to six month age uh, bracket. Uh, treat all your introductions and so a quarantine treatment when you're bringing in cattle and check farm history and cattle before sending or bringing in. It's possible to do a bit of due diligence on the cattle that you're purchasing to see if they come from an area that has either ticks or a history of tyleriosis. And make the best use of your uh, clinical um, veterinarians and your uh, laboratories for diagnostics and for developing biosecurity plans. If you want to read more about the Australian experience, it's summarised on our Parabos website, and that is um, our main uh, extension arm of the Australian livestock industries. It also covers uh, worms, lice and uh, flies but um, all of the information that I presented there can be seen in uh, various iterations on the Parabos website. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Playford. That was um, a really nice um, coverage of, of a lot of stuff and, and nice having that Australian perspective. So we appreciate it. Um, and we're gonna kind of transition right now into um, a little bit more on tyleria and, 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 and adding in anaplasma um, with um, more of a US focus. And what we're gonna have is, um, we're gonna have Mr., um, excuse me, Dr. Kevin Lommers, who's from Virginia, Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine, talk to us um, a little bit about that. So thanks again. Thank you. Hello everyone, I trust you can see my screen. Um, yeah. All right, so thank you. And there's gonna be a bit of overlap between uh, uh, Dr. Playford and myself um, in some similarities, but some differences between what we're seeing here in the United States versus what uh, has been described in other parts of the world. Um, First, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm a veterinary pathologist here at Virginia Tech. Um, I'm the son of a dairy vet in Ohio. I grew up in Ohio, went to school in Ohio, and then went out to Washington State where I did some uh, residency training and then also a PhD in anaplasma marginale. And how I got involved was we had unexplained cattle deaths here in Virginia in 2017 and 2018. Um, Eventually, we found out that, that there was tyleria in the herd affected, and in then following up on that and working with others, including Dr. Yabsley, who we heard this morning, we identified that we had tyleria orientalis 
the Akita genotype. Um, so that's how I got started. We're going to talk about Tyleria orientalis, um, just touch on the tick briefly, a little bit about transmission, um, and then get into some regional information and a summary. Feel free to uh, to save your questions. We're going to have a question and answer session at the end, and I'm happy to answer them at that point. So to reiterate what's already been said, Tyleria orientalis is a Tyleria but non-transforming as compared to parva and annulata, which typically lead to lymphoma. Uh, we don't see that with Tyleria orientalis. There are three main genotypes or subtypes that affect cattle. Bufali, which is theoretically benign. Yeah, we knew it was in Texas and surrounding states for decades at least. And there have been a couple reports, one in Michigan and one in Missouri, about clinical disease associated with that particular genotype. However, uh, Katosi, we've found in Virginia, Texas, Louisiana, Vermont, and Wisconsin, as well as our neighbor to the north, Canada. Uh, but the, the one we're going to focus on today is the Akita genotype, which was originally found in Virginia. Uh, it's a cause of infectious bovine anemia. Uh, key point here is it's absolutely no threat to humans. Uh, as we've heard from Dr. Playford, uh, along the Pacific Rim, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, it is economically important. It is transmitted by the Asian longhorn tick, but also has the, the potential be transmitted mechanically by shared needles, lice biting flies, and potentially transplacentally. Um, in slight juxtaposition to Australia, there, where there isn't a lot of overlap between the distribution of Akita and Anaplasma marginale, we see it in the same regions here in the United States. The economic cost of Anaplasma per year is estimated at $300 million to the U.S. cattle industry. Um, we see acute disease. Uh, which usually occurs about one to eight weeks after infection. And what we see during that acute disease is they'll get anemic, lethargic, they'll get a fever. We see a lot of icterus or jaundice, so it'll be yellow and potentially ventral edema. The, the stock answer is one to 5% death loss, although I would suggest that it's actually zero to much higher than 5%. Uh, we have seen herds with mortality events that are up to 30 to 35 percent of their herd. 10 percent is not unusual. And on the other end, we have herds that have no idea that they are positive when all of their animals are carrying the disease. So another syndrome that we see is late-term abortions. Uh, we, we are investigating whether there are more earlier-term abortions, but primarily late-term abortion, and then calf mortality is associated with Tyleria orientalis akita. Um, this is in contrast to anaplasma marginale, where we don't typically see any calf losses associated with that disease. So I want to talk about acute versus chronic. We see disease associated with that acute infection. Um, and it often happens uh, associated with periods of stress. We see it uh, associated with calving. And here in Virginia, we have fall and spring calving, also with heat stress and potentially nutritional stress. Once the animal has uh, controlled that acute infection, the numbers of organisms will greatly decrease. They will or decrease by, you know, a thousand fold but they are persistently infected for life. And so that is good and bad. It is good if you're doing surveillance in that you can detect all animals that have ever been infected with Tyleria orientalis. It's bad in that all animals that have ever been infected with orientalis have the potential to be a reservoir for infection of other animals. Here on the right, I have a graph of anaplasma marginale, uh, but this is very similar to what we see with Tyleria in that during acute infection, there's large numbers of organisms. 
and then the animal controls it, but it never completely eliminates the infection. So no clinical signs is probably the most common. Again, we're looking here at vulvar fold, unexpected death, anemia, icterus, weakness, abortion, or calf loss. So calf losses is different than anaplasma marginale. So this is a photo courtesy of Pat Cummin, and uh, one of our practitioners who has a six-year-old says that her daughter calls them banana cows just because the, the amount of yellow um, in the fat that is blood breakdown products that are uh, not able to be uh, gotten rid of quick enough. And so the adipose tissue or fat turns yellow. So blood smears may allow you to detect uh, during acute infection. Again, you're seeing thousands more organisms in the blood than what you would see during that more chronic phase. You uh, need a good quality smear and some degree of expertise so that you can identify the organisms and differentiate anaplasma versus tyleria versus a Howell Jolly body. Here in the US, we have serology for anaplasma, but as in Australia, we don't have a sero serologic test that's used for anything beyond research at this point. We have, at Virginia Tech, we developed a duplex PCR to look at anaplasma marginale and tyleria orientalis because they are clinically similar. There are uh, probably approaching a dozen labs that now have stood up tests in the US. Um, I share positive controls to multiple labs. Um, and so depending on where you are, there may be other labs that would, would like your business. So I'm just showing another picture of the pureplasms. Uh, there in the center, we can see that it's kind of a, a signet ring, almost uh, asymmetrical, dark blue. And this is with a right Geem sustain. This is with a diff quick stain, which is something that's a little uh, more readily available in practice and out in the field. And again, you can identify them. You're looking at purple on purple, but uh, in, a, in a, an acutely infected animal where there are large numbers of organisms, you are able to identify them. One of, uh, one of our things that we wanted to do to help producers and veterinarians is to figure out when should you send us a sample for testing in an acutely infected animal or a, in a clinically ill animal. And so we, we have a challenge in that once animals are infected, they're infected for life. And so if you test for Tyleria in an endemic area, it's quite possible you will have positive animals, but that doesn't mean that Tyleria is the cause of clinical disease. And so we compared the uh, threshold cycles in real time PCR to get an estimate of number of organisms. And we saw far more organisms in anemic cattle than in non anemic cattle. So one of the first things you can do is look to see whether the animal is anemic. If it's not anemic, then probably uh, tyleria isn't the cause of your clinical disease. Um, that's a quick answer for a, a, a lot of work by a graduate student. Treatment options. There's equivocal data um, saying that maybe tetracyclines work. I'm not sure that that's useful information because they need to be treated before they're even clinically ill. Uh, buparvaquone is not available in the US, although uh, there is some discussion that it may be uh, eventually available for treatment. Um, Australia's been dealing with this for 20 years, as we just heard, and they don't have it uh, approved yet either. Again, it, it probably isn't helpful for the severely anemic animal, um, but it may be helpful in treating others in the herd that, that are starting to become clinically ill. The recommendation is to limit handling, good nutrition, B vitamins, access to water, minimize stress, and for, to that end, some uh, folks are pulling uh, brood cows into pens so that they don't have to compete for food and water. So, we are undergoing uh, a good bit of surveillance 
most of it centered initially in Virginia, but then expanding out. We are working with our uh, state Department of Ag to do um, both clinical submissions as well as active sampling at livestock, livestock markets. Uh, and also the Department of Corrections Herds in Virginia, as well as working with practitioners and producers. We've started working with other states, including West Virginia, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, New York, Texas, Ohio, and North Carolina, and are open to additional collaborations. Uh, but as the we identify the disease further and further out, uh, I think there will be more and more people involved. So the story starts in Virginia in identifying six dead cows in a pond in Albemarle County. Uh, we figured out what it was in early 2018 and identified it in two additional counties, one immediately adjacent to Albemarle County, but then a second county geographically distinct from those first two. In 2019, we started finding more counties and additional counties in 2020. Um, the point here being that we are identifying more counties partly because we are looking and partly because I think that the prevalence is increasing throughout the region. Um, so here's an example of a subset of our data. Um, and what I would like to point out is that we have on this map black dots, which are negative for any of uh, Tyleria or anaplasma, orange stars, which are positive for the Akita genotype, blue circles, which are positive for anaplasma, and then green squares, which are the Kitosi genotype. And we can see that anaplasma and Akita overlap. And so we, we need to consider both of those, although there are some regions that there's far more anaplasma than Akita genotype. So at this point, states with Akita positive animals, uh, I should have added one more here, Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee, Kansas, and one more, uh, New York. We've confirmed it in Kentucky as of a couple weeks ago, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and confirmed in North Carolina. So uh, this image, the blue is the known Kitosi locations. Uh, the red is the known Akita locations. Virginia, we have found Bufalia, Kitosi, and Akita. However, in contrast to what's been described in New Zealand and Australia, we haven't found mixed genotype infections. We have found Akita or Kitosi or Bufalia, but we haven't all found two of those in the same animal. We have found anaplasma and Kitosi and Anaplasma and Akita, but we haven't found multiple genotypes in the same animal. Uh, a little closer in uh, the area the, of, of Virginia and West Virginia, this is county data where we have Akita positive animals. And so we can see that uh, there, there's quite a lot of counties identified in Virginia that's because of the amount of surveillance that's been put in, um, but we're finding multiple counties in West Virginia and not all of them are immediately adjacent to Virginia. Um, and then the same with Kentucky, Tennessee, and North Carolina. I can tell you there are more positive counties in Northern North Carolina that are adjacent to positive counties in Virginia. We just haven't uh, mapped those yet. So these are the ticks. Uh, these were the first ticks that were found in Virginia um, in 2018. So these are the Asian longhorn ticks. Uh, this is a distribution, predicted distribution map that uh, Denise Bonilla showed uh, earlier as well. So most of the eastern half of the United States, but also some potentially regions on the west coast as well. Uh, picture, code, yeah. A photo courtesy of Dr. Tom Lavelle, who's a, a state vet here in Virginia. Um, we don't see low numbers of ticks. Uh, oftentimes when we see them, we see hundreds to thousands of ticks. Another thing to point out here is that there are multiple 
life stages of the tick in the same animal um, as opposed to them being discrete in their time period when they're out we can see larva nymph and adult all in the same ear and to kind of tie the distribution of the asian longhorn tick and akita locations where we have the asian longhorn tick are red locations where we have Akita are yellow and then locations that have both red and yellow are orange. So you can see the majority are orange uh, and it's quite likely that most of the red and yellow that are adjacent to each other are eventually going to be orange. We just haven't found the tick or uh, Akita yet. So uh, geographically in Virginia it seems to be in the higher elevations um, as opposed to in the lower elevations in the uh, tidewater region, we don't see uh, the Asian longhorn tick and we don't see Akita. However, uh, some of that is stocking density. There are fewer cattle in that portion of the state. So uh, Dr. Lindsey Fry, who's gonna talk tomorrow about some interventions, uh, collaborated and she did a study where they looked and confirmed transmission of Tyleria orientalis, Akita genotype, um, with the Asian longhorn tick, both uh, of uh, U.S. origin. And so the first thing that happened was we sent blood from a positive animal here in Virginia out to the state of Washington, and an animal was inoculated with that blood. And after 80 days, there was a drop in PCV and a uh, increase in detectable parasites in the blood. Um, we used the PCR assay and we can see that we started to be able to detect it um, at 56 days as a so much earlier than we actually saw the organisms. Then uh, Dr. Fry fed Asian longhorn ticks on the infected calf, took those ticks off, allowed them to molt, and then place them on naive calves and confirm transmission. Um, here we can see that we're starting to see organisms as early as 15 days, um, but typically by 25 days, we could identify uh, parasites on blood smears. Um, but with real-time PCR, we could pick them up at two weeks. Um, and so just a little quicker with real-time PCR, um, but another compare and contrast is that with the tick feeding, we are seeing positive animals at two weeks rather than 80 days, um, which makes sense in that we are, instead of mechanically infecting, we are putting a biological vector, which is going to put large numbers of organisms into the host quickly. Um, and so you, you would see progression to parasitemia much faster uh, with that route. So transstadial transmission, but not transovarian, which uh, again means that the different state, it, the tyleria can be transmitted from one stage of tick to the next, but not from the adult to the ova, which is good. Uh, a little more easily controlled that way. Um, there was more rapid transmission with uh, ticks than mechanical transmission, and a, but uh, we shouldn't rule out as mechanical transmission as a an important cause or route of transmission. Uh, and again, this is Kevin Lawrence, uh, uh, who's in New Zealand, and some of his work showing that sheep can get infected with the Akita genotype and serve as a reservoir for infection with uh, the for Asian longhorn ticks. It probably isn't all that important in endemic areas because if you have positive sheep, you probably have positive cattle in that area. It would be more of a concern if you were moving uh, positive sheep into an area with the Asian longhorn tick, but without a Keta genotype at that time. So uh, focusing a little more on regional findings, this is the number of clinical submissions um, averaged over uh, per month. And so we can see orange is negative, blue is positive. 
uh, we can see that there are peaks in um, April and then again September and October. Uh, that can correlate with when we're seeing spring and fall calving and so also when we're seeing the most uh, sick animals and the most animal death. That also happens to follow when the nymph and the adults are out and active. This overlay is uh, Alec Thompson, who Dr. Yabsley mentioned, uh, did a two-year study at the location where we first identified uh, the Akita genotype. And so we're not sure whether those peaks in clinical disease are associated with um, increased mortality associated with spring and fall calving or increased activity associated with ticks. A little bit of an indication of prevalence, how many animals are infected. We started monitoring sale barns and in 2018 and 2019, it held steady at right about 2% of all samples that we tested from cattle going through sale barns were positive for the Akita genotype. Uh, that jumped in 2020 to between 10 and 25%. Um, and we have started working on our 2022, and it's probably going to be closer to 50% of animals that come through Virginia sale barns are positive. And so it isn't just that we are doing more surveillance, it is that it is becoming more and more prevalent and more and more widespread. So um, that's a graph of that same data in the top right panel. The bottom right panel, we have a uh, uh, a group that aggregates approximately 200 yearling animals every year, and we test those animals at intake. And in 2019, one of the animals was positive for Akita. In 2020, 18% were positive, and in 2021, 48% were positive. And these are typically registered purebred animals high value, high genetic value, and well-maintained herds. Um, and so it's it's not just uh, small farms, and it's not just folks that aren't paying attention. These are people that are putting in effort into biosecurity, and it is still um, entering into their herds. So again, I gave an estimate of 20 million a year, which, uh, maybe 1.2 million higher than Dr. Playford mentioned, um, at an estimated cost per positive animal based on uh, animal mortality, uh, treatment, um, production losses, abortions, uh, the estimated cost per positive animal is $760. Um, one veterinarian in Central Virginia shared with me per data on morbidity, mortality, abortions. And with that, I came up with an estimate of over $250,000 in client losses over the last three years. And so this is not a theoretical problem. This is actually happening um, in, in the mid-Atlantic right now. If this were to spread similarly to anaplasma and it's clinically similar, perhaps there would be similar um, economic impacts per year. Um, this is a word cloud that we put together from the clinical submissions that we got. Uh, obviously, when you're requesting Tyleria and anaplasma testing, those are going to be more prominent. The more times the word was used, the bigger the word. And so we can see a lot of weak, dyed, necropsy, ticks, jaundice, yellow. Um, PCV. So I just put that in there that the, the clinical scenario um, is, is fairly consistent. Okay, so management by zones. It's employed in New Zealand as well as Australia. And for us, we are seeing um, a little different in that we didn't have the tick endemic in the United States for as long as Australia and New Zealand did prior to the introduction of Akita. And so we have regions that are, uh, are tick positive that 
um, do not yet have Akita. We have regions that have Akita but don't have the tick yet. Um, and so it's slightly different. So we need to think of endemic areas, areas where we have the tick and we have Akita. We need to think of free areas where we don't have the tick and potentially don't have Akita and then those fringe areas. So we want to prevent disease in the free zone. So uh, test animals and try to prevent the, the spread of the tick, um, try to prevent bringing in Akita positive animals. However, if you're in the endemic zone, bringing in naive animals, ones that haven't been exposed, uh, puts them at risk in that they would potentially uh, get infected and either uh, die or more likely be sick and then recover. Um, in Virginia, one of the biggest risks is bringing in breeding stock, breeding bulls, where we can see um, you know, these are high dollar investments because you're working with, uh, you're investing in genetics with those animals. And so a loss of a bull is a bigger hit to your genetic progress. But also, if the bull is naive and gets infected during uh, breeding season, there will be decreased libido. And so one of the things that we see is the first few cows are bred and then there's a month to a month and a half gap and then the remainder of the cows are bred or if you're pulling the bull, uh, you've got a few um, that are bred and the rest are open. So uh, some herds have already started considering bringing in Akita positive animals into endemic regions so that they don't run the risk of losing those animals when they eventually become exposed. Um, so ALT and, and the Tyleria orientalis Akita have a similar distribution. We have all three genotypes in Virginia, but Akita is by far the most common. We found it in multiple states. There are tests for this. They are all PCR based. Um, we have started working on pooled testing. So if you are in a fringe area where there, or in a free area where there isn't a high prevalence, we can actually pool those and bring the cost per animal uh, down significantly. One of the things that um, I didn't mention, but that I wanna bring up is when we find a clinically positive animal, we then ask to uh, test more of it, more animals from that herd. And we have found that once you find your first clinical, it's most likely that 80, 90 to 100% of your herd is positive. It's just that the majority of them did not show clinical signs. We don't have any approved treatment and control of the tick is the current suggested prevention. And we're gonna get into that with other speakers later in, in this uh, webinar series. Uh, Something I want to reemphasize, the majority of infected cattle have limited clinical signs and not all clinical disease in a positive animal is the result of tyleria. Um, there is no obvious long-term health or production effects of persistent infection. And once infected animals are protected from subsequent clinical disease, I should change that to clinical disease. They can become infected with other genotypes, but they uh, don't typically have clinical disease. And so Dr. Playford mentioned uh, the potential for infection with bufali uh, to protect against clinical disease associated with Akita. Um, what can we do to control for Tyleria, testing for detection to know what you've got in your herd, supportive care for anemia or for anemic animals, stick with your single use needles, which are important for anaplasma, it's important for Tyleria, it's important for bovine leukosis. Uh, those repeater syringes for vaccines are sure nice, but the potential for transmission, we have seen outbreaks associated with um, herd vaccination. They happen four weeks after the entire herd was vaccinated. Um, 
transfusions. Again, that was mentioned uh, as something that happens in Australia and New Zealand. Um, sometimes that's geographically challenging here in Virginia, um, but also a, a potential intervention. Folks are starting to do it in Virginia. Um, some of that is just having practitioners who are prepared to do that um, because it's becoming more and more prevalent. And consider your region um, region's status when decision making your decisions on Tyleria. Um, we're continuing to work on surveillance and uh, trends as well as expanded range. We've started collaborating with USDA APHIS um, to help us do that. Improve diagnostics available to clients and for surveillance. Um, we're collaborating with uh, USDA, AR, USDA ARS and uh, Dr. Fry, who will talk about that tomorrow. Um, we're looking more into the mechanism of abortions and uh, we don't see as many calf deaths here, um, or at least don't have as many calf deaths reported. And so I'm not sure which of those is the actual uh, truth, whether it is that we just don't have them or that we don't uh, recognize them as part of the clinical syndrome for Tyleria. Um, we're also working on percent positive within herds based on housing. Uh, whether they're on dry lots or pasture or confinement, and then uh, again, the development of interventions. So I want to thank uh, folks here in Virginia at the Department of Ag and the Vet School, as well as folks at the USDA, um, Michael Yabsley, uh, and the farmers and veterinarians, as well as the funding. All of this is a, a collaborative effort and um, one person gets to present, but it's the work of a lot of people. And so uh, I want to thank you for your time and also thank you to my collaborators. With that, I'm done and we can move on to the next. I will answer questions later when we have the Q&A session. Thank you for listening. Hey, can everybody hear me? It looks like I'm transmitting. I'll go ahead and start. My name is Steve Hopkins. Um, I'm supposed to give you my producer um, experience, um, particularly with Tyleria. So I'd like to do three things um, here in the next few minutes. First, I'd like to describe my operation so you better understand uh, my experience in dealing with Tyleria. Second, I plan to discuss my experiences with Tyleria in, in 2018 and then my lesson learned in 2019. And then third, discuss the preventive measures we use on our farming operation for Tyleria and control of ticks. Uh, where I'm located, if you remember the maps that you saw uh, recently um, in the last presentation, I'm in Louisa, Virginia, which is right in the central part of, of Virginia. It's between Charlottesville and Richmond, but on that map, um, it was in an epidemic area um, on the eastern side, um, kind of in the center part of the state. Uh, my farm consists of a little over a thousand acres. We farm with my two sons. We have approximately 300 fall cabin commercial cows separated in five groups on separate farms, but all these farms are within about a 10 mile radius. Three of the farms are very close together and two are a few miles away. And the farm that I had the most problem is one of those farms that are a few miles away. We also custom feed about 175 bulls uh, but that's on a separate farm adjacent to the home farm. In the fall of 2018, in the um, last third of the cabin season, on one particular farm, here again, it's one of them that's a little bit further away, I started losing cows to what was later determined to be Tyleria. Um, during a period of about 10 days, we lost about 10% of the cows on, on that one farm. Not on the other farms, we did not lose any cattle, any cows or calves on the other operations. In addition to the seven cows we lost on that one farm, um, we lost about another 10% of our calves that were stillborn. So between the cows lost and the stillborn calves, we lost about 20% of our calves in the herd in that, on that fall on that particular farm. We did have a few more stillborn calves um, that year at other herds a slight uptick, um, but nothing dramatic at the time. It didn't really um, 
seem like that many extra, but looking back on it, I think there was probably a connection. Um, we also had a few more stillborn calves in 2017, whether we had uh, the disease at that point, I'm not sure. We have also had problems um, in the past with anaplasmosis. And at the time of the problems that we were having in 2018, we initially thought it was anaplas. But after losing cows of all ages and cows that are treated did not respond to antibiotics, I knew something was different about this. Some of the cows went down and died within 48 hours. Others just, just dropped dead. Uh, we were also feeding chlorotetracycline in the mineral for anaplasmosis at that time. Um, and we hadn't lost any cows to anaplasmosis probably for at least 10 years. So it did seem like something different. But here again, at the time, we, we did not realize it was tyluria. Shortly after hearing the concern of a new tick disease, which was tyluria, um, that winter, um, which was right after fall calving, we decided to bleed um, a dozen cows, um, and the dozen cows that were open that we bred at were cows that lost calves over the complete operation, over the 300 cows over the five different farms. When we got the results back, 11 out of 12 came back positive, even though we would not experienced any problems in the other herds. Also, our conception rates, um, just for note, were normal. So that was our experience in 2018. As I said, I also was gonna share my lesson learned in 2019. In the summer of 2019, I purchased 22 red cows. Um, these cattle came from a farm about 40 miles away to the west. Um, about two thirds of those were AI bred, do the calf in mid September. I added them uh, five weeks before calving to the farm I had the problems with in 2018. I kept them as a separate group until calving, but they were on the same farm that I had most of the problem. Uh, the week they started calving, I, I commingled the herds together to be able to better check the calves. And they started calving. Um, I lost two cows uh, within one hour of each other um, to Tyleria plus I lost at six of the additional calves that were stillborn that were all AI bred. The calves born later um, that were not AI bred seemed to be fine and I didn't have any more cows, any more problems with the cows. I didn't have any problems with my own cows um, on that farm uh, that, that fall, only those that I purchased. Um, we did try to limit the stress uh, we, we knew with Tyleria that was critical, so we didn't get the cattle up. We, we basically tried to have as little stress on them as possible, but of course the stress of calving is, is what triggered it. Since 2019, I cannot say we've had problems um, or significant problems from Tyleria. We have lost a few cows um, that did show some clinical signs, um, you know, with the fat being yellow. Uh, it could have been anaplasmosis. Um, it could have been Tyleria, but we really haven't seen a real problem with that. Uh, we've had very few stillborn calves since 2018, so I think that was probably connected to Tyleria additional outbreak in 2018. Uh, we are very careful to work at cows um, to limit any additional stress on them. We have not seen any problems uh, with our calves. Um, I've noted that the speakers talked about two months later, um, seeing problems with these calves. We have not seen problems with our calves. We have not seen problems with Tyleria in our preconditioning program. Uh, we have not had any reports or any calves after they're sold um, and gone to feedlots to have any problems. And we keep close ties of these cattle all the way through to harvest. So I feel like if we had any problems, we would have known about it. Um, since 2019, like I said, I, it, it hadn't been that bad of a deal. Control measures as far as what do we do on our operation. Um, we use poron insecticide on cows at, at preg check time in the spring. Uh, we put fly tags, uh, control of ticks and flies um, in the, probably early June, right at weaning time. And then we're putting a poron insecticide in November um, and when we vaccinate the cows also. Uh, we also practice the use of separate needles on each cow to prevent the spread, even though obviously um, 
checking that we, we have tyloria throughout the herds, uh, but we still practice that. And anaplasmosis, doing those tests, um, you know, that was a much lower percent. Um, I believe that was, it was certainly below 20% um, when we checked those animals, even though 90 some percent were had tyloria. Again, we haven't seen problems elsewhere in the cattle. Um, we haven't found any type of treatment, um, kind of goes along with your earlier speakers um, for tyloria. Uh, they don't seem to respond to antibiotics. Um, we do believe that we have built up immunity uh, with our own herd. The other thing that we practice um, as far as uh, prevention measures, um, after experience, certainly in 2019, when I added those cows five weeks before calving, then they went through the calving period and had the problem. We're very sensitive to when we add um, calves to herds or, or bred heifers to herds. Um, when we're moving the cattle around, we certainly try to do it at least 10 weeks before calving time or after calving. So uh, we, we certainly try to stay away from on that period of time of six to seven weeks um, before calving, um, you know, right before they go under um, additional stress. Uh, that might have been a little bit shorter as far as time period, but that's a summary of the experiences I had. And um, I think we're getting ready to go to questions. And then if it's any questions of um, experiences that we've had, I'll be glad to answer them at that point. So uh, at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to the moderator. Thank you, Mr. Hopkins. I, I apologize. I, I was I did introduce you, but it turns out I was on mute. So I appreciate your your time um, and, and I appreciate um, Dr. Lamer's presentation also. So um, I'm hoping that all of our presenters are still around with us now so that we can um, kind of kick off our question and answer session. Um, we uh, did get a few questions in. Um, as we were going, and so I'll I'll start kind of working through those. Um, the first question we got was, can you talk about how to submit ticks for identification to our National Veter Veterinary Services Lab, and is there a particular entomology contact person or department at Entomology Veterinary Services Lab? Well, um, for those of you who um, work with or with or in the USDA, um, we do have a group that does um, basically parasite identification. Um, if you don't work with or within the USDA, you can still send in your, your, your parasites. What you do is um, you Google USDA and then five dash, so hyphen, the five hyphen three eight, and it pulls up a form that you can fill out and it tells you kind of how to submit something. However, because this is um, a USDA group, we um, will, they, they prioritize which samples they will um, identify first. So you may be waiting for a while. Um, I would say that, um, uh, you know, based on program needs. So I would say that you can do that, but you might have a better turnaround time with, with a local vector control department or one of your extension folks from your your state agriculture, um, maybe possibly even um, a state um, uh, public health group could possibly help you. Uh, and then there's a website that you can um, turn in pictures and send in photos. Um, I mean, send in photos or send in samples called Tick Spotters. Um, and you can Google that and, and that will actually help you too and getting your, your ticks identified um, a little faster than maybe going to NVSL. Um, if you do need to send to NVSL, you can put it to the to attention of the parasitology department on your form, form and, um, and, and then you can get back your information as, um, as they can get to it due to whatever priority there is. So um, the second question was, are there any practical means the state could adopt to prevent the introduction of Asian longhorn ticks? It seems futile given the three hosts, given the three hosts that include migratory birds. Um, so yeah, it does, it does seem futile. We're gonna spend a large portion of tomorrow talking about this question specifically. 
Um, and um, we're also going to, at the end of the day tomorrow, talk a, almost exactly about this question with a panel of um, basic, our, um, their state agricultural folks from different states that have had Asian longhorn tick and give, they're gonna kind of answer that question in, in a way and talk about things that they've done. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause on that question and hold it for tomorrow. And, and I think that by the end of tomorrow, you'll have your answer. And if you don't, feel free to email me and I will, um, we can get in touch and I'll, we can have a long conversation about that. So um, with that, those are the two, um, the first set um, of questions that I had. If you have any questions for any of the speakers today, uh, feel free to type that in the chat. Type your questions in the chat, um, and we can answer those those now. And I'll give you a few minutes to be able to do that. Dr. Bonilla, we had a couple of additional questions come through. Um, are there currently known risks of transmission of any of the zoonotic diseases to humans through consuming beef or wild game from animals that are carriers? I, I'm, this is likely, yeah, I'm trying to think, but off the top of my head, I don't recall any of the tick-borne pathogens, specifically those associated with ticks from ingestion, but things like anthrax and uh, TB, mm -hmm. brucella, and all of those, certainly, but not tick-borne. Yeah, I I would agree with that. I can't think of any either. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's there's diseases that it, from you know the actual processing processing of animals rather than the ingestion that would lead to zoonotic diseases like tularemia. But um, even from what we can see for Asian longhorn tick, it doesn't. Right from what we know now, it doesn't affect their tularemia. So um so you know there's there's that also um anyone else have any have a response for that question um, okay i think we can move on to the next question michaela if, you, if there is another yep we have a couple more um can you please repeat the seven states where aikida is present so we know that Akita is present in Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and then new additions are New York and Kansas. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yep, we have some more coming through. Are there any current observations about BLV status of Tyleria cases? Um, so the question is BLV status on Tyleria cases. Uh, we are starting to look into that and yes, there's BLV in beef herds, but um, we haven't seen an association between BLV and clinical case. Okay, thank you. All right, a um, couple other questions coming through. Are there, this one's, this one's pretty broad. Um, are there any long-term strategies or strategies on the horizon for Tick management. Again, I, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, so let's revisit that question at the end of the day tomorrow. Are there All any right. other? Yep. Um, what advice do you have for producers and officials in areas that do not currently have the tick? slash pathogen but are identified as living in a suitable habitat for both again this is something we're going to talk about a bit tomorrow but in in general i mean when you say pathogen i mean it could you you could be talking about multiple pathogens so maybe you're talking about tyleria <laughs> it's possible um 
I can tell you just about the tick, just in general, you know, you're going to need to do, you're going to need to be vigilant, treat your animals, watch your animals. Um, you're going to need to do some habitat management. Um, there's a lot of things. And again, we're going to talk about it a bit tomorrow, but I'll let our other um, speakers weigh in on that for now. I was just going to say tomorrow I have a talk that's called tick identification and uh, I'm not going to be able in 15 minutes to teach people how to identify ticks to species. What I'm going to do is just talk about general aspects of tick ID and then use my time to encourage people to have an interest in collecting ticks and submitting ticks for identification uh, and being part of the active process of tick surveillance. So yeah, I'll touch on that as well. Thank you. Are there any specific beef cattle breeds that tend to be more resistant to ticks than others? I do not know in the United States. Worldwide, there are certain breeds that are more resistant to certain tick species than others, but I have to say I don't know about ours here. All right. Um, can you speak more to when a producer should or should not test their animals with no clinical sy symptoms and what type of test should be done easily? I'm going with Kevin, the assumption that we're ta talking about yeah. Tyleria. And um, I'm not sure I have an easy or great answer for that. Uh, it depends on where you're located. Uh, state regulations vary. Uh, currently, Kansas has made this a reportable disease. Um, not that they are imposing any uh, import or export restrictions, just they want to know if there are any uh, Akita positive animals. Clinically positive or clinically ill positive animals in New York are then quarantined. Um, and so um, that may impact your decision. As far as when and why you would do surveillance, one of the things is if you are in a fringe area where you have the either have the tick in your region or have uh, some indication that there's a Kita in that region, you might want to know whether your herd is positive or negative so that you can interpret, um, you know, open uh, cattle or icterus with an idea of whether you're positive. And so it's most likely not Tyleria or you were naive. And so it could be Tyleria. Um, so, and also if you are a um, registered herd or uh, producing seed stock and want to use that as a marketing tool, that's another reason that you might want that information. And as I mentioned earlier, at this point in Virginia, some folks are actually selecting or uh, trying to find Tyleria positive breeding stock just so that they don't have to deal with the potential loss or decreased libido associated with that naive animal getting uh, infected. Okay, thanks. And, and one of our other researchers um, weighed in on the question about um, resistant um, uh, strain breeds of cattle and um, Dr. Lohmeyer, who's going to present tomorrow from our cow fear tick in fly lab, um, tells us that Boss Indicus cattle have been shown to be more resistant to ticks. Um, they at ARS steer clear of those Brahmin crosses for, for in their research for that exact um, reason, because they, they need to actually be able to feed, feed the ticks on the animal. <laughs> so, um, so that's a um, good, good um, answer from, from an expert. So. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Um, have you seen any cattle co-infected with anaplasmosis and Tyleria? Yes. 
Simple answer to that one, yes, we have. Do you have any recommendations for producers um, what they should do with an infected carcass? Um, there's really not any risk of uh, infection from that carcass. It's not a human disease. And um, unless you were mechanically moving blood or blood products into uh, an open wound on another animal, that shouldn't really be a risk um, to, to any other animals. Any other questions? Yep, we have a couple more coming in. Mm -hmm. So here's a question specifically um, from a producer in their situation. Um, so they live near I-81, which is a root of Ikea, and they are a purebred Charlet producer. What is the test they should ask for from their veterinarian? Yeah, so this is Virginia area most likely. So the, the test would be they would want the uh, Tyleria anaplasma duplex and you can send it to Virginia Tech or you can send it to VDEX who will then forward it to us. If you're planning on testing large numbers of animals, you may consider contacting our lab. We uh, may be able to help you with uh, pooled surveillance. So feel free to get in touch. Were any of the positive cases of Tyleria in the US uh, associated with sheep? Some were on farms that had sheep, but uh, they had plenty of other cattle. So I don't know that the sheep had any anything other than they were um, innocent bystanders. Well, I think that that is, that is all the questions that we have coming in um, from our attendees. Okay, wonderful. So um, we will have a little bit more time tomorrow for questions and answers. Um, if you have any that you think of overnight or didn't get your question answered today um, or come up with something next, um, in this talk that proceed in next next uh, in our next day so we're gonna we're gonna start the same time um, tomorrow um, that will be noon Eastern and um, we're really going to focus tomorrow on control prevention um, and then we're like I mentioned earlier we'll have that panel discussion on um, from some of the affected states for Asian longhorn ticks um, but I want to I want to thank you all for for being here today. I want to thank all of our speakers who were absolutely amazing um, I, I, for giving their time and 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 giving you so and me so much information. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, I'm I'm excited to start another day with you guys tomorrow. Um, and with that, I think um, does anyone else have anything they want to add before we sign off? Well, thank you. We'll see you all tomorrow.